Hey, how you doing? It's Clayton here from HowToDrawComics.net, and welcome to today's Creator Spotlight. Today, I'm joined by the one and only Rob, and uh, the creator of Replicator, of course. Mm -hmm. And we are hoping that uh, we're going to get John Malin on the show. He has told us he is going to come. Um, it has happened before that our, our special <laughs> guests unfortunately don't always uh, show. It's a little bit embarrassing, but... Uh, you know, John is a really cool guy, and we're both super excited about having him on today. Because hell yeah, you know he's he's a prominent figure within um, you know, within the industry and and whatnot. But uh, here he is, so we'll add him to the stream oh, now. Perfect timing, right on time, John. How's it going, guys? You hear me all right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hey, John. Hey, John. Good, good. I, I'm on my tablet, so I had to get the microphone reset up, and I had to get rid of Kelsey's ghost. The whole thing was configured for a prank. <laughs> so, <laughs> what I'm Kelsey's ghost? Why are you on your tablet? <laughs> um, because we were uh, talking about how to draw comics, so uh, I, I have to draw from my tablet because I can't do it very oh, well. My so you're going to do yeah. some drawing today? We could. Um, I, I guess we'll see how it goes. So, awesome. um, if you, I don't know how your guys' format usually rolls out. So, and I'd turn my camera on, but you'd be looking up my nose. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Uh, man, we keep it pretty chill. Like, this is a conversation between like minded artists and, and creators. So, uh, you know, because we're streaming to the How to Draw Comics community, obviously, there's a lot of people watching right now who are just starting out on their own artistic journey who no doubt would gain a lot of insight and a lot of value out of your story and, and how you came up in the game. So mm. I guess where we'll start with this is just where did comic book illustration begin for you, John? Did you, or have you been drawing since you were a kid? Are you a little bit more like Mark Silvestri who only started getting into drawing later on? Mm. Uh, what, I wish. Deal? Yeah. Like, yeah. A prodigy. No. Um, <laughs> I, I, I had a weird transition. So I, I started with a fan of cartoons, you know, in, in the 80s. And nice. um, even though it was a little bit young for me, my little brother was big on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And because I, I was already drawing, like I draw, you know, a little bit of, you know, cartoon characters or like Johnny Five, the robot. And um, I, I drew, but I wasn't, I didn't have any direction for it. And my little brother... Um, handed me like some uh, coloring books, like Teenage Mutant Ninja, Tur uh, Ninja Turtle coloring books. And he wanted me to draw him some Ninja Turtles. So uh, I started doing that. <clears throat> and uh, eventually I, I got okay with it. And uh, even at school, I I'd be just kind of noodling them. And I you know, kind of became like the Ninja Turtle guy. And then a little time later, my older brother uh, went to a gas, I think it was a gas station and shoplifted a, a whole bunch of comic books. So he almost awesome. got busted. And uh, he had, I, I think what he told me was he had put the comics, like he had just went outside and put them on top of like the ice machine. And, and, <laughs> and the clerk came out after him and said, you know, you know, what are, show me your hands or, you know, lift Ooh. up your shirt kind of type stuff. And uh, he got away with it. And when I got home, there were a whole bunch of comics. I mean, it, to me, my memory, it, it's like there's 100 or 50, you know, books, but it is probably closer to 10 or 20 uh, books Whoa. scattered on the floor. And so I was like, oh, okay. You know, I, I knew of comics. I wasn't completely unaware. I mean, they were everywhere when I was a kid, you know, like grocery stores and spinner racks. And it, it wasn't unheard of. And uh, yeah, and I looked at them. And I was like, and all of a sudden it just started to click. I was like, these are a lot better than coloring books. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I started going that way and I don't, you know, look, I already been tangentially like into comics, like Spider-Man and his amazing friends, you know, I've like big Spider-Man guy. Um, I, I love Batman, you know, Batman 89. I was already primed and it was right around that time that all this had happened. And then I was just like, Broop. and, uh, so I'd go, I'd buy comics and, uh, you know, it turned out that I got into these a few guys named Jim Lee, Todd McFarlane, Rob Liefeld. And mm. very quickly from there, um, within a year or so, these guys had moved on to form Image Comics. So I bolted over there. My attention went over there. And that was it. I mean, at, at that point, I, I was I was pretty gun ho that I was going to get into comics and do my thing. 
Um, but I was too young. I was too dumb. And it wouldn't be until about uh, 2002, I think, that I moved to California. I, I had an opportunity to, to uh, interview for an internship at uh, Image Central, the, the publisher of Image Comics. And uh, that, that was just because I had happened to be on their website that day. And they had a banner ad and said, like, looking for an intern, you know. And I was like, yoink. So I, I got in contact. They they found out I was from Michigan. And I was like, whoa, 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 don't cut me out for that. I'll be there. And I hopped on a flight. And I went there. Whoa. And, uh, wow, man. Yeah. So I, I'm from Michigan. So, I mean, this is, uh, this is you know, a drastic distance from there to California. And, and how, uh, how old were you, John, when you decided that comics was, was it for you? Um. Uh, around 13, 14 years old. So, because I, I remember when I was 14, I, I made a mental note. I, I was like, this is what I like right now. And I'm going to try to figure out why. And so that's kind of been like my journey of comic books is trying to figure out why Todd McFarlane, Rob Liefeld, Jim Lee were more attractive to me than, you know, the more refined people, um, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. Even Mark Silvestri, you know, who, who at the time wasn't super refined, but um, uh, say like a, your Neil Adams, you know, um, yeah. Frank Frazetta's, like these guys, I like could really just draw like a really good form, but I, I was kind of turned off, you know, but Todd McFarlane, Jim Lee, Rob Liefeld, those guys were on fire for me. And uh, so, yeah. And uh, eventually I met Rob Liefeld. I did uh, a book with him called Nitrogen. Uh, he, I lived in... Brea for a time in Fullerton, and I think Rob was living in Fullerton. If not, it was it was your Belinda at the time. Uh, they neighbor each other, and uh, yeah. So I did nitrogen with him. I ended up going back to Michigan because uh, Southern California, specifically Orange County, is very expensive. So I was like, uh, I'm going to go back home and live like a king. <laughs> so uh, that's what I did, and uh, did a bunch of odd jobs, managed to get uh, a one little break in a Marvel. Didn't last very long, but about three issues. And uh, then I was right back out into the, uh, you know, the, the, the regular jobs, you know, construction work specifically. And uh, then I started developing this thing called Graveyard Shift with a, with a friend of mine, Mark Poulton. And Every time I got started on it and started getting pages done on it, I would get offers for work. So Rob got back in touch with me, Liefeld, and uh, asked me to draw Youngblood for him uh, back yeah. in age. And I was like, hell yeah. So I did, I don't know, seven or ten issues of it. I don't remember what it was exactly. And, um, and then when that job was over, it was back to Graveyard Shift. And yeah, that's, that's Graveyard Shift right there. And then as I was working on Graveyard Shift again, all of a sudden I'm getting hired by Marvel. So then I go and work for Marvel for two or three years. And um, I did thunder, a run on Thunderbolts, and then I did a run on Cable. I did a couple little small things in between. And uh, then I went out on my own. I mean, there, you know, the, the, the atmosphere there wasn't to my liking. I was getting censored, and I didn't feel they were letting me do what it took to make a book like Cable um, fly. Uh, among other things. And uh, so then I went off on my own and, and I, and I, and I pretty much set it down that I'm like, I'm going to finish graveyard shift. And if nothing happens from it, um, that's it. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to just kind of walk because it's been a long journey, a lot of stress, a lot of, a lot of uh, ups and downs, uh, big ups and big downs. And yeah, and then as again, as as it's always been, while I went back to work on Graveyard Shift, then all of a sudden this guy Richard C. Meyer contacts me and asks me if I want <clears throat> to do a book called Jawbreakers with him. And I'm like, you know, we worked out a pay, and as with everything, paid work always comes before unpaid work. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so I hopped into that. Um, he was very controversial. I was seen as controversial at the time. And uh, we figured that our controversy together and abilities uh, could actually do some damage on a crowdfund. So we gave it a shot and we launched our crowdfunder and a, a lot of stuff in between. I don't, I don't know how much I want to go in detail because these are all long stories, but yeah, yeah, we ended up raising at the end of the day uh, 400 and some odd thousand dollars. 
Wow. And that ignited what became um, Comic Gate, Comicscape Publishing, uh, the Comicscape wow. Creators Network. And now a lot of people benefit from this. And uh, Ethan Van Skyver followed up with Cyber Frog. Um, I, uh, Mike Miller was there for a time. He did Lone Star. Mitch Breitweiser came along and did Red Rooster. Then uh, I got to launch Graveyard Shift. And then I raised, uh, with that, I did another 106,000. And uh, then I launched another Graveyard Shift. As a follow-up, we did 175,000. And we're about to launch our third Graveyard Shift in June. So hoping to do anywhere in that range. It'd be great. Uh, I've got so many questions, but you, you answered so many of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one thing that stood out, uh, like, sure, the number of, of amount of money you made on uh, on Jawbreakers is, is is crazy, but you had 10,000 backers. Mm -hmm. That is bananas. How does that feel? How was that whole It was life? great. It was great. But I also tell people 2018 was like the, the longest year of my life. So... Yeah. Um, the amount of energy now, <clears throat> this is something people don't think of often, but it's the amount of energy that is required to kind of launch a movement or a network. Well, a successful one. And, uh, the energy that we had that year, um, through controversy and sabotage <laughs> from the mainstream, it was huge. It, ca it can't be duplicated. And we were getting a lot of attention. Richard got invited to go on, uh, I think it was like a, Jim Jeffries show. He got invited to go on Joe Rogan. And oh wow! Yeah. So yeah, yeah he he, he Is that that one up. It Didn't happen. He should have done it. Uh oh yeah. So I think that's one of the things he says he regrets. But um, you know, I don't. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I would imagine it'd be a regret. That would have been a big win to get to get our message out and all that about mm -hmm. uh, these awesome comic books. And. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it, it it was a very long year, very successful. You know, ten thousand. It's hard to duplicate that. Um, mm. I think we'll all see those numbers again, um, but it's going to be through you know steady growth. You know, once that bomb had gone off to to birth this, you know, now what we have to do is we have to maintain and, and make sure that people are are out there promoting and uh, you know speaking well of Comicsgate and the comic book industry and promoting their projects. Yeah, totally. For s such a positive movement, uh, the controversy around Comic Skate is is absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know what people you would, were going you, on about actually it, at it, first. If you, if you weren't there, you wouldn't believe it because it's so rid ridiculous. Yeah. Um, just one little benchmark. Uh, uh, this is the one that really sticks with me is that, uh, first of all, we were all mischaracterized 100% because um, a lot of us are like politically moderates and uh, these people were from the far left. Um, they were they were mislabeling people as Nazis. I mean, these mm. very career destructive terms. And uh, the one that really stuck with me was when the uh, editor in chief of Aspen Comics, I think his name is Vince Hernandez, uh, said that we, Richard, myself, presumably everyone on the Jawbreakers book, were extremist. <laughs> and uh, to me, an extremist is someone with violent intent with box cutters or bombs. <laughs> mm. uh, not a comic book artist who's just saying, hey, can we chill <laughs> out on these politically divisive topics? Totally. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. And, uh, you know, Comic Skate has just done so much good for, for independent creators. And it's come along at a time where all of this stuff is possible as well. It's yeah. just really, it, it's put fuel on the fire that was already there and, yeah. and really allowed. I mean, when has there ever been a time when a creator, like any one of us, could just create a book, put it out there and see, you know, five figures, six mm. figures within a matter of days? Yeah. And and here here's comic skate privilege is that, when you are in comics gate all of a sudden a number like thirty thousand dollars raised doesn't look like so much but rob liefeld did a crowdfunder on kickstarter for brigade and he only raised like thirty some thousand dollars he's worked in the industry for 30 years you know um he's a legend he created deadpool you would think that his numbers would be through the roof but mm -hmm. in comic skate, that's that's what we would probably say is about mid tier. So the upper mm -hmm. tier is you know 
six figures plus. Ethan Van Skyver, Richard, myself, at a time, Mike Miller. Um, we Comicsgate has, I think, I, I don't remember what Ethan said. It's like 21 of the top 25 comic book slots on Indiegogo since like 2018. Like, yeah, those, are, those are us. It's great. Even like uh, you got new players too, like RGE, Rage Golden Eagle, mm -hmm. Von Klaus is he's he's at like seventy something, I think. Yep. Um, Cal Jameson was at seventy something. Uh, Kyle Ritter. No one need, look. If you ask the average comic book guy what they think of Kyle Ritter, they'll say who. Well, he raised. I think he's at about one hundred and sixty thousand yeah. um, dollars. That's comic skate guys and yeah. um, people yeah. who don't respect that. You know, don't do it so well. Um, but also, we also have smaller tier guys. So we still have guys that are out there that are just starting or just building their audiences. Um, and they're raising 5,000, 10,000, um, sometimes up to 20,000. You know, so we we want to see the point where everybody is getting like, I mean, it'll never be everybody because, you know, the the skill le levels are different. The, 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 you know, what type of project you're launching. It has to have mass appeal. It has to be just like any other business. You have to have that great product. Um, so we'll probably always find people that are doing like, you know, 1,000, 5,000 or 10,000, but we want to get as many of these quality projects up to where they're getting 30,000 plus. Um, and, and, and this year was stronger than last year and uh, the year before. I mean, we're, we're all getting better. The, the, there's more and more comic skate books, a wide variety of content, superhero, horror, um, you name the genre, witchcraft. I don't know. It, it's all out there. <laughs> and uh, it, it's from having a network and building a YouTube channel. We, we tell everybody that's step one. Get out there on YouTube, build your channel, get an audience, um, be passionate about what you want to do. And as long as, as long as your audience believes in your passion, they'll come out there and they, they will help you succeed. And uh, hopefully you will give them an excellent product for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I think that that's part of building that reputation as well. Comic Skate is, is one component of it, but then you've got that marketing, then you've got the, the building a reputation, trust with your audience. You hit the nail on the head when you said it's like any other business. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of creators, I don't think that they – they realize or want anything to do with that business side of things. But if you're going out at this on your own and it's always worth it to do that because you really yeah. can build something great by doing so, by investing that time and energy, um, you know, you, you just gotta, you gotta tackle that stuff as well. It's, it's definitely half of the equation here. Well, mm -hmm. I get, I get triggered when um, like mainstream or non comic skate people say, Oh, you've only made ten thousand dollars, or you only made twenty thousand dollars. Like, when you're starting out, out, that's a lot of money, man. That's mm -hmm. that's that's a success, and you've just got to build on that. Go, you know, keep building it up and up and up and up. Yeah, and then hopefully one day we'll le we'll reach the levels of of John Malin, and you know, dream to reach Ethan's level. I'm sure. Yeah, I, I want everyone to be getting you know one day a hundred thousand. Ethan even said the other day. You know, right now, like the top 25, like the lowest on there is like 80 some thousand dollars. But um, two years from now, we could see the lowest number on there being two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So we could have that many more projects uh, getting into those high, high numbers. And, uh, you know, that would be great if that happens. I, I don't know if it's going to happen that quick, but I mean, it would be fantastic. Um, yeah, sure. absolutely just while we're on the topic john do you want to explain uh, in a little bit more detail how exactly comic skate works because for a lot of people watching some of them will know about it some will have heard misinformation about it and others will yeah just want to know more so you're probably the one of the authorities to go to on this uh, i i have a good idea i think everybody has a lot of different ideas on what they what they think it is or how it should be ran, whatnot. There, no one's in charge. It's, it, it's an idea. It's a network. Um, basically, we all kind of formed along the lines of, it, it, especially for me, it's ma it, this was something that I saw for mainstream. Independent market, I really don't care what independents do. But when you're specifically superhero comics, what we all kind of agree on was that we didn't want to see divisive politics taking people out of stories. So we believe comics, comic books should be escapism and uh, good entertainment for everyone. Doesn't matter what side of the aisle you fall on. Like go in there and don't worry about your kids being indoctrinated for a far left or a far right agenda. 
Just go in there, have a good time with your comic book. Um, the other part of that is for creators. Uh, creators, uh, we are, whether you like it or not, the idea is from your boy, Zach, we sell hot dogs. So we want to be there. We want to make our customers happy, put a smile on your face, um, and, and give you the, the hot dog that you want. You want onions on it? Okay, well, we're going to make you a hot dog with onions. Here you go. Um, and so we took all the complaints that, that were geared towards the mainstream, and we said the creators are, are largely saying, um, all right, well, well, we'll make those books for you guys. We're going to make those books that aren't divisive, that are fun um, and edgy and, and can do all that without making uh, some kind of political zombie out of you at the end of the day. You know, we're going we're gonna to do Star Wars. <laughs> so, uh, hell yeah. so that's in, in, in a nutshell. I mean, it's not much more complicated than that. Treat your customers with respect. Uh, give them a little extra rope than you ever would and try not to get into arguments with them. I mean, you can definitely have rebuttals with them in conversations. Um, but if it starts getting to where you're going to tell your audience, uh, you know, uh, basically F off, um, we, we recommend you just mute those conversations and move on and uh, keep everybody um, at an even keel. So, Yeah. Hell yeah, man. I mean, that's like a lot of other businesses hire entire teams to maintain customer sa satisfaction. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what happened to the mainstream comic book industry in that regard, but uh, it doesn't seem to be there a whole lot of the time. In fact, it's almost the opposite kind of doubling down on customer unsatisfaction a lot of the time. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, you know, I, I think what happened with uh, the mainstream in, in large part is they've decided probably decade ago, I don't know, maybe two dec decades ago, this, you know, that bad press is good press, you know? Mm. Oh yeah, we can, we can stir the pot. We'll, <laughs> we'll get people aggravated at us, but through that firestorm, we're going to pull in new fans. And it's like, yeah, but you're causing a firestorm, man. You're burning down the old to bring in the new, <coughs> but the new that you're going for, they're not bringing the dollars. Like, you know, look, a lot of the comic book audience is 40 years old now. Like the people who have bought for decades, you know, their thirties, forties. And uh, they have jobs. They have good jobs. And those are the guys that come in uh, or used to come in every Wednesday to their local comic shop, drop in 100 200 $500 um, because they love comic books, like <laughs> above all else. And uh, so they told these guys largely to get F. And uh, so these guys come over to Comicscape and they say, now here's my money. Watch mm. me spend it. <laughs> and, and that's how a lot of the, I mean, look, I mean, Ethan sold a cover, I think, in one of his campaigns for $10,000. You know, that's wow. not just someone buying a cover. That's someone saying F you, <laughs> you know what I mean? To, to mm. everyone out there in the mainstream being like, that's money that could have went to you guys. That's money I could have spent on your stuff, except you you got political, you got crazy, the election broke you, we're sorry, um, or other ideal, uh, religious views or whatever your hang up is, you just mm. couldn't shut up about it. So mm. we're going to re re reward the people that take the most moderate stance on these things and make good comic books. Yeah, and like the majority of them are amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, look, I mean, we, it, it, all types, all types, guys. We, you know, we are comics gay. We are independent comic book creators. I mean, so yeah. you get stuff that may not have such a great shine to it, but then you have other stuff that is super slick and, and mm. completely commercial, mainstream. Um, you know, I, and, I think, and I think the more mainstream, I think the more the audience ends up going in there and backing those projects. So yeah. again, you know, you look at Kyle Ritter, he did Star Blades. This book is freaking fantastic. The Kyle is the probably the best, if not really close, the best colors in the comic book industry, not comic yeah. skate, the fucking mm -hmm. industry. And he mm -hmm. did a hundred and, and the guy can draw. <laughs> That's he what crazy too. Um, he 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 came out of nowhere. No one knew who he was. $160,000, whatever it is, uh, through comic skate. Because he's fantastic. That that style is slick. Um, but then we also have other things that are much more indie, um, mm. less slick. Uh, they may not be doing so well, but they might still art artistically. They may not be at a high caliber, but they still might pull in ten grand because people like the creators through the YouTube network. Yep, for sure, like hundred uh, percent. I've got a couple of questions for you, John. Uh, 
you're mainly digital now, but you do do some traditional. Is that right? Um, I rarely, <coughs> excuse me, I rarely do uh, traditional. I, I did a commission um, for an for an art auction on Ethan Van Skyver's channel, uh, Comic Artist Pro Secrets, mm -hmm. and uh, that was the first thing I drew traditionally in a long time. So oh, I, wow. I don't really do it. Um, even like covers for my books, I, I, I don't generally do like actual work. When I, when I did Thunderbolts, that was like probably the last real piece I ever did on paper was I did this like 20, I don't know what it was, like 25th anniversary cover or something like that. So it had everybody on it that was ever a Thunderbolt. And uh, mm -hmm. so that one I, I ended up selling. Yeah, and that's uh, more graveyard shift right there. So, Very nice. Um, and you're self-taught, yeah? Like you, you mm -hmm. didn't go to any school? Yeah, no school. Yeah, school of Liefeld, McFarlane, and Jim Lee. And uh, like, for an example, like I, like I said, when I'd get on graveyard shift, you know, I'd also have to be working regular jobs. So I would do construction. And during my layoff time, I would come back in here and start drawing. So a lot of the stuff that you're seeing here was like drawn during layoff. Um, but I, I could only do minimal work during construction here because my hands would be just numb and swollen. It, it was it was hard work. I banged on metal a lot. <laughs> so. it, all right, this this might be off the mark a little bit, but it seems like you had to work really, really hard to get your shot. Is that is would that be accurate? Oh, I, I mean, I would say yeah. Um, you know, here's an example. I I when I was trying to contact Marvel and get into Marvel. Um, I found out pretty quickly that like they're, t you know, <laughs> McFarland said this a long time ago that, you know, they, they would hand, you know, Hey, they'll tell you to give it to like a submissions editor or whatever. And McFarland was like, don't, that guy's a flunky. And I found out pretty quick that, uh, Marvel's talent coordinators, they are flunkies. And that used to be CB Sabalski and, uh, eventually Ricky Purden, both of whom never hired me. I got hired by going around them. And uh, Tom Brevort, as a matter of fact, is someone that, that I was emailing directly. And I could track back from the time that I got hired by Tom um, to the first time I contacted him in my Gmail, because I, I, I was contacting from an old Yahoo before that, but I don't know how long the Yahoo went back. But from the time that I was first contacted Tom Brevort to the time that I got hired by him, that was 10 years. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. That's some that's some that's dedication. Jeez. Yeah, I never gave up, guys. I followed the three P's. That was be polite, uh, patient, <laughs> and persistent. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> awesome. And, um, Crazy. Th there's a lot of uh, parallels actually between uh, kind of what's happening with Comics Gate and even you, John, uh, with Todd McFarlane, because I know he he left marvel comics because they they weren't letting him do what he wanted to do the the necessary things that he felt needed to happen in order to tell a compelling story unnecessary was, censorship exactly the same thing totally man mm -hmm. um were you like what was the reaction of the people around you at that time when you decided to leave do your own thing and then i guess later uh enter into comic skate or help create comic skate did you lose a lot of friends during that time? Did yeah, you yeah. I, I, had, allies? <laughs> I had, you know, someone that I considered a friend. We've hung out in real life, both from Michigan, um, both working for Marvel. And, um, you know, I, it, as soon as the whole comic skate thing happened, you know, it was like I, I saw people unfollow me, you know. Um, but I was surprised with who did stick with me as well. So I was like, oh, okay, well, that's cool. Not everyone hates my guts. Um, because I'm taking a, a stand against this like divisive politics in mainstream comic books. Um, but yeah, I mean, once once someone starts labeling somebody else a Nazi, uh, it's very difficult to, make, to hold on to your friends. Uh, that that's what slander does. So um, I'm, look, I'm not. But <laughs> what helps build that image was like again, I don't want to go too deep in this stuff. But go as deep as you want, man. It's cool. Character assassination from bleedingcool.com, Rich Johnston specifically. So mm -hmm. he went and did a article about me being a, a Nazi or an alt-right white nationalist trying to connect me to those groups. Why? Because when I drew Thunderbolts, I had this little background image, a uh, uh, little Easter egg, because we were doing a flashback to a storyline called Pleasant Hill. 
And Pleasant Hill kind of was reminiscent of this movie called Dark City. And in the movie Dark City, there's a place called Shell Beach. And, and this place doesn't really exist, um, but it's a plot point in the movie. So when I did this little background, I, I wrote on like a billboard, Shell Beach. Um, Rich Johnston took that as trying to connect me to somehow the Matrix with red pilling and that the Matrix and Dark City were both connected to alt-right white nationalists. And uh, th this was the bullshit uh, that I had to deal with. So once you have articles like that coming out um, from political zealots like Rich Johnson, I mean, you know, the, the handshakes go away. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's hard to get past that, man. Um, it must have been a bit heartbreaking too. Uh, these people who you thought were, were going to be loyal friends just kind of turning their back on you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't know how much I'd consider some of these people like hardcore friends. You know, I've, I've associated with them. I would think that reasonable people would be reasonable enough to say, um, can we hear the counter on this? And even comic book resources, uh, CBR.com, they took that alt-right article that Bleeding Cool did and they repeated it. <laughs> and it's like, what are you guys doing? This isn't true at all. You guys are scumbags. Um, but it's because the, uh, you know, the comic book industry to a large degree has been taken over by far left uh, zealots. It's sad. It's true. And a lot of these people, even the ones who may like me and still, you know, unfollow me or don't talk to me, look, they might like to, but they're they're weak human beings. So they're afraid that even to communicate with me would be the end of their career. I mean, it's serious. I, I understand how stupid it sounds to somebody outside, but yeah. again, keep in mind, we were called extremists. <laughs> mm. Like literally the other week, I had to pass on a message from someone who works for the big two companies to someone in Comicsgate because they were afraid to say it mm. to them personally. It's just ridiculous. It's insane, guys. I mean, it's it's Mean Girls Club going on out there. It's <laughs> it's freaking weird. Got uh, quit look, I come from construction, so, you know, I'm, I'm used to, like, you know, some gruff language and tough dudes and all different types of people working with you. Complete assholes and also great people out there as well. Not that everyone's an asshole, but I come from the real world of construction, factories, you know, blue collar jobs. And I, I go into a place like Marvel and I'm just getting my, I'm getting whiplash. I'm like, what the, what is this like pretend world we're hopping into here? <laughs> it, it's silly. It's really silly. Yeah. Man, it's so on the from uh, Malin Malin, what resources did you use to learn uh, books? This is talking about drawing. Uh, did you lose, uh, use books or anything? Sure. Um, you know, I recommend everyone start with how to draw comics the Marvel way. Um, I, I think everyone at Marvel Comics, every editor right now should have that on their desk. <laughs> um, <laughs> they, they forgot. They forgot about Jack Kirby dynamics and, and how to do these, like, really big, engaging things. I mean, you know, some of the stuff is flashy there, but it's still losing um, a bit of that impact of someone like Kirby. Uh you know, there, there's so many things that that people I, I, I see, even in comics, I see a lot of people with not a great understanding of like layout. Um, more often than not, I see panels that are not drawn with the idea that there should be word balloons on there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every panel should have, you know, a, a dead space, a negative space where you can where you you will instinctively drop a word balloon. Um, and I see people dropping word balloons, you know, right over top of figures and backgrounds and things that are important for like establishing what's in the background or where they are in space and time. And, um, you know, there, there's a whole art form here and, you know, under, go, you know, go check. I, I need to get this book again, but, uh, understanding comics by Scott McCloud. Uh, you got to know all the nuance of, of page design to get into, to have the full impact. I believe, um, it, it's, it, it's a bit like Steve jobs, right? He, he everything matters from top to bottom everything matters and it has to be laid in there in in such a way that it that it, it, it looks elegant so every page should without the reader even noticing should just visually be this beautiful graphic and that's right down to the placement of the word balloons and balancing the word balloons between the figure the panel 
or where it goes on the overlap, not with no tangents, um, and, and, and the space should be. I, I'm a firm believer that like the writer, the writer needs to be there for the lettering process, at least to go over it. Because when I do these graveyard shift books and the supplemental and all this, I bring in the writers. I'm sitting there with Eric Weathers and we are going over everything. We are chopping out text because we realize that the balloon is overpowering the panel or yeah. it's crowded in there. So like, how do we make this a little bit shorter without hurting, you know, the, the, the emotional impact here? of what we're trying to go for. And, and almost always we find a great solution around it. Sometimes it takes, you know, finagling, but we'll figure it out between three talented people sitting there. And, and then what you get is hopefully at the end, you know, even like, to, you know, if you have too much dead space, then you say, hey, let's add in an extra balloon here, kind of get rid of that. And uh, I like, I know right now there's, there's two panels in Graveyard Shift Volume 3 where I was like, oh, I wish we would have added more text. Um, you guys will see it when you when, when when you get there. You'll be like, look at all this negative space. But <laughs> even still, we, we we try to balance that stuff within that negative space to where that shape of that balloon, you know, complements uh, everything around it. I mean, it, it, if there weren't words in there, you know, it, it's still a nice shape. Uh, everything matters uh, from the the logo. You know, I heard I, I've told this before, but I. I, I was listening to like Elliot Fernandez in, in a Mike Miller stream one day and Elliot, Elliot was talking about, you know, basically the merits of a good logo. And Mike's like, I've never seen a logo sell a book. <laughs> and it's like, no man, everything matters because oh, yeah. it, it's the experience from the front cover to the back cover. It's everything in between. If everyone yeah, isn't, yeah, if everything isn't in its place and elegant and proper and uh, beautiful, then you failed and you got to fix it. I mean, it's a lot of editing. Mm. It is, man. But that logo is exactly what people are going to see all the time and associate your book, you know, their, their understanding of your book. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it's brand like, new. what do you want to achieve? Do you just want to achieve, you know, a comic book? Because if that's all you want, you can do that. So can, you know, a 16 year old writer with maybe a 20 year old average artist, they can achieve a comic book. That's fine. But if you want to achieve something special, um, a, a masterpiece, at least attempt a masterpiece, then you got to You got to care. You, know, you got to oh, yeah. care about everything. It, you know, it's, it, it's the McFarlane thing again. You know, he, he talked about portfolio reviews. You know, he's like, well, you got to go up to an editor and that editor's got a gun and he's got six bullets and. Every bad thing he sees, you know, is a bullet at you. And eventually it's fatal. It's the same thing with, you know, the comic, you know, the logo. <laughs> is that a hit or is it a dud? You know, um, boom, you get past that. Great. Now they're looking at the art on the cover. Now they're looking at the placement of, of everything, anything else within the, is it a great composition? Is it? And then you go to the next page. Ooh, is, how is the design on this credits page? Is it, is it aesthetically pleasing or is it trash? And uh, trust me, it can easily be trash, <laughs> you know, so you don't want that to be a, another bullet against you. And then every single page on the inside of that book is an opportunity to lose your audience. So each page needs to matter. That's if you so care about it that much, and if you care about things that much, and, and if you have talent, if you have an eye for talent, if you, um, you will be successful. You have to, you know, I, like I look at like even Rob, you know, with Replicator, he, he got the right guy, Aaron, the book looks great. You know, he's going to go very well and very far with, you know, that eye for talent. And, you know, he's brought people over to me too. And I'm like, yeah, okay, Rob, like Rob's a good guy, man, because he's got an eye for it. Um, but you also have to be thinking when you launch a campaign, um, like I did this thing called the spit roll, this thing called tank heist with a few other guys on, on stream one time. But the goal was how do you make a billion dollar movie? What, you know, you, you have to get rid of all the shit. You have to objectively get rid of all the shit and do what it takes to make a fucking hit. And uh, I, I had that same mentality when I did jawbreakers. I said, if I do this, how do I do a book that that's going to make two hundred and fifty thousand dollars? Because I didn't imagine we could do four hundred. Um, and I said, well, if I was a fan, um, what would I pay top dollar for? Um, my best attempt at doing like a Travis Charest. You know, I may not succeed throughout the entire thing, 
But I, as a fan, I would pay top fucking dollar for Travis Charest. So when we did that, you know, so when we launched that campaign, th those pages on there, you know, looked as as well as I could do them at the time. But I, I set my goal really high, and I exceeded it, but not because of my art. I exceed, you know, we exceeded the goal because of the circumstances around the book. But you want to be, you want if you want to make a hundred thousand dollar campaign, don't think about what you want to do for you. Think about what's going. What does it take to raise a hundred thousand dollars? How do you bring in the widest net possible? And uh, you know, if, if you really want it all that bad, if you want to be financially successful, that's how you have to start thinking. Not for you, for the fans and what they want, and uh, do your best to execute that. I, I saw a campaign re recently. It hasn't launched, uh, but it had like a, a Trump parody hat on it. You know, and. The guy asked my advice, and I said, "Get rid of the hat. <laughs> um, you're here for customers, customers, customers. If you want to be here for politics, that's fine. But you're not. You're you're likely going to have a hard time being very successful because somewhere out there is a Trump supporter. Um, somewhere out there is a Hillary supporter. Um, good example. When the first graveyard shift went out." Um, we have like the president of the United States, but as like the bad guy, but he's no, he's not meant to be any one side left or right. Um, but he had a blue tie and I said, shit, because I'm like, I don't want people to think that's like a democratic thing. So in the reprint, it, it's, uh, I believe it's a gray, it's a gray black tie um, because we don't want to have people run off. Look, if you want to be politically divisive, if you really want to make a political statement, that's all fine and dandy, but it's not necessarily something that we're rooting for in Comicscape. So, and I want to bring in everybody. Yeah, and, and from like our point of view, we're from a different country, so we're not really that interested in, you know, American politics too much. Mm -hmm. So people going on about either Trump or, or Hillary as an example is, a, is an immediate switch off for me. I'm like, yeah, I, I, think, I, I think being universal, you know, good versus evil is, is great. You know, something where, yeah. look, if you're on the left or right of politics, you can see yourself in that good guy and you can see your opponent in that bad guy because it's a, you want to have a universal language going on of good and evil. And that's it. Totally. And it's funny because I get inclusivity, right? Making uh, comics more diverse and that kind of thing, but not at the cost of excluding the, the majority. Mm -hmm. That seems senseless to me because it means that you're going to make a minor amount of profit in the end. Like right. no matter how good that book is, you're, you're marketing that comic or that project to, to a, a minority market. Mm -hmm. So it can only make so much. Yeah. Um, um, Again, I you know I say <laughs> with um, Marvel and DC, that's where I put those opinions towards because I you know as look I grew up on Marvel. I'm you know I, I was geared towards that. I'm conditioned for Marvel, and I you know even when I hate them, I still want them to win. And like I want you guys to do your absolute best to make money, especially in these hard times. And uh, you know people say, oh that sounds like there's some bigotry in there. No, look if I was. In China, if I was a white guy and I grew up in China and there's a comic book industry and it's on its last leg and I say, how do I make money in this? I say, well, I'm going to make my Chinese superhero character. If I really want to start getting political, I'm going to start turning people off. I'm not going to do that. Um, universal languages. Let's do this, you know, where, where it's good versus evil. Uh, you know, if, if I really wanted to have white representation in there, yeah, maybe I'll do a white character in there somewhere, but who cares? You know, I'm here to make money for this product. And, uh, if I happen to help the comic book industry along the way, then great. Uh, but when you're on your last leg, diversity is fine and it's great. And, you know, if you want to have all your different types of representation, cool. But what they did with Marvel was they went about it the wrong way. Um, and I used the example of Iceman. Uh, they, they took a character that, you know, you can see their, their thoughts, you know, thought balloons for years. You know, you, you knew without a doubt that Bobby Drake was a ladies man. And what they did was they basically had Jean Grey up one day and say, Bobby, you're gay. And, and then all of a sudden here comes the gay Iceman series. And all the Iceman fans out there are like, what the fuck? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And, and I said, this is stupid. And then what happened was people were called homophobes for that. And what my position on that is, and, you know, this is my position, is I said, look, if you wanted to turn someone like Bobby gay, 
Um, first of all, I say don't do it. Create a new character. Let them be gay. And yeah, exactly. let the character live and breathe for 30, 40 years. And, you know, maybe just like Deadpool it came out of nowhere, right? But it still took 10, 20 years for him to be red hot. Uh, yeah. Let him go through their, their journey, just like uh, North Star from Alpha Flight. And mm -hmm. you can build from that. If there's a market for it, that market is going to find that character. And then they're going to they're gonna buy the T-shirts. They're going to put them on the bumper stickers. Um, he's going to be at every gay, pri gay pride parade from here to Doomsday. But let me say, if you had no choice but to turn Bobby Drake gay, here's how I would have handled it. I would have set out a five-year plan. I would have said, look, we're going to put Bobby onto this journey as like a subplot. And, you know, we will hint at it. And over this course of five, year, five years, you will find Bobby maybe becoming more withdrawn, something that can be relatable to people. And mm -hmm. just, you know, kind of coming out with these feelings over time to where eventually the audience is saying, I know what's up. And then by the time you get to the end of year five and Bobby comes out, Everybody can at least, you're not going to make everyone happy. That's why I'm saying don't do it. But if you did do it, at least you're going to have people, even your naysayers say, at least they did it well. It was a good execution. It was a, it was a, it was a true journey of a character. Um, but bottom line, don't do it. But if you're going to do it, that's how you do it. With I, good, I, can't, good I can't imagine like the gay community would like that either. Like you, you have a character that is, is suddenly just gay. Mm -hmm. As opposed to building a character that, that was built to be, is is that way? It just mm -hmm. it, it doesn't seem like something that they would like. Yeah, I yeah. I, I can't imagine. And um, you know, just like the what they did right before the pandemic here, they announced uh, safe space and uh, oh, we've had a lot of fun with them. Snowflake, <laughs> snowflake. Oh, right. my gosh. And it was so bad and universally panned by straight people, by gay people. <laughs> and what, what, what was being said is like, look, for like actual um, homophobes out there, that's how they, they would parody or that, that's how they said like comics gay would have parodied um, Marvel superheroes. What, they would have made them look like this and they would have called them Safe Space and Snowflake. And Anna, that Star Wars girl, she did like a redesign. And what I liked best was like just the code names that she had. She turned Snowflake into like Snowblade and Safe Space became Safeguard, you know. But then she also redid, redid the costumes and all that. And that was fine, Danny. But it's like, yeah, it's like you didn't even give them the respect of a good code name. And yeah. what happens is, is everybody who critics and criticizes that uh, it used to be that you were a homophobe. Boom. Oh, you must be a homophobe. Um, but it, then it turned out LGBT uh, community criticized it as well. So are they homophobes too? Or is it finally being acknowledged that you guys are doing these things in a very poor way? Execution is everything. It, it is, man. And like, especially with something like, uh, oh, what, what's the Iceman? Is that his name? Iceman? Iceman, yeah. Yeah, so... You know, it's it's not about being homophobic. It has nothing to do with that. It's about character consistency and continuity. It's just poor, slack, terrible writing to uh, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, mm. come out with uh, and it completely overhauled uh, sexual orientation for the character, which is you know a big deal for a lot of people. Like mm -hmm. that's a deep. And, and fundamental part of ourselves and to just uh, change that up with that with very little explanation is mind boggling. Yeah. Well, it, look, I mean, you know, it's still a divisive topic. So why would you want to divide your audience further? So, you know, right mm -hmm. now people are kind of there. There's like a little thing in the in the air about they're going to turn Wolverine gay and uh it's like, you know how many bikers have Wolverine tattoos? <laughs> oh my goodness. You know what I mean? Like, these guys are going to be like, what? You know what I mean? Look, you like it or not, you know, these guys uh, may also be Wolverine fans buying Wolverine comic books or buying Wolverine comic books for their kids. It's divisive. So, um, and, and let me say, when, when Marvel did come out with Snowflake and Safe Space, I made a point to say, at least you guys made new characters. I applaud them yes. for that. But what yeah. they did was they did it in a way not for good press, for bad press. They wanted it to, again, start a firestorm, 
burn out the people who who and it, who don't approve of this and to call them homophobes or racists or whatever whatever is they want to call you um, and, and completely ignore any valid criticism because what they wanted was the press. So again, yeah. they, they shed more of their audience for an audience that doesn't care and doesn't buy. If they did, the sales would be through the roof by now. I well, there's stuff a dice, but yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's good bad press and there's there's bad bad press, right? So, like, I remember when uh, the Aliens vs Predator game came out and it was going to be banned in Australia. Um, that that was bad good press because it just made everybody want to buy it more. You know, mm. there was something in there that that you know the the government wasn't allowing people to access, and it made you want it more. It was like, yes, I'm going to play it specifically because it's violent and over the top. But uh, it seems to be that the mainstream is is going for this angle where it's bad press, but nobody is interested in it anyway. Right. Um, it's like I think it was the the record straight out of Compton. Was that what it was? They had to put a parental advisory sticker on it. And because of that fact, it yeah. blew up like just ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, there's a lot of parental <coughs> advisory. I think they still do that stuff. Uh, I don't buy video games or, you know, CDs or anything like that these days. So uh, I, I don't know what the uh, branding is on all of them, but I think they still do parental vi advisories for things. And you know what? If you want to have a, a rating system, I you know whatever. I'm I'm kind of indifferent to it. You know, if it's rated G or whatever for kids and PG thirteen, what I don't really care. I'm not going to put any on my book. Um, yeah. So, but I don't know. Maybe if I was doing like you know hardcore you know pornography or something, maybe I put like an you know I don't know an X or something on there. You know, so you know not to let the kids get it. But I mean, I do have some responsibility. But totally. other than that, you know, as long as everything is, you know, basically what 14 year old John can handle, uh, I don't see any reason to put a rating on it. Let's uh, let's let's take it back um, to the, the art. What tools do you use, John? Um, I use well, like right now, this is my mobile studio pro from Wacom. It's, you know, kind of, I guess, higher end gear. I don't know, two or three grand for it. it's expensive. Um, but I, I've done I've done. Well, all Graveyard Shift 3 on it, or 2 on it, I'm sorry. And, um, yeah, I like it a lot. So I use Clip Paint Studio, which used to be Manga Studio. Nice. And it, uh, it used to be a very simple program, which is what I liked. But now it's getting closer to Photoshop, so it seems heavier, a little harder to use on, on my simpler stuff. But I, I keep everything simple. Like, I don't, I'm not like the guy that knows how to do all the tricks, you know, like the Photoshop tricks and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I use a G pen. It's just like the default nice. pen in uh, Manga Studio. And then I just start drawing. <laughs> so that's about it. Um, you know, I, obviously I'll use like a line tool or a rectangle tool for like panels. Um, you know, but I, I try to do my best to just kind of, you know, keep it all just like I was working on paper. What I do wish is that. Here's my million dollar idea. If anyone wants to take it, you guys can send me a check if you get a million dollars off it. You know, I'd appreciate <laughs> it. But here's my million dollar idea because I draw right on this screen here. Um, but I, I, I'd like to just be able to use like because I can zoom in and zoom out by pinching. You know what I mean? The screen. Yep. And uh, but like I have all these you know ellipses and stuff from like traditional work. I would just like to be able to throw down a circle template and draw a circle. Um, but I can't because that's not good for my screen. So what you need to do is you need to get a circle template with like that felt or whatever surface underneath it. So if you combine those and then uh, like even a ruler. So like why would I have to use a ruler tool if I can actually slap a ruler down on my screen here and have all my tools right here nice and handy. I don't have to worry about what happened to the setting or why something got jacked up. But I can just start drawing with a ruler on my screen. How great would that be? Hell yeah. I, I love the ruler tool in uh, Clip Studio Paint. Mm. I recently discovered that and I'm like, oh my God, this is going to significantly increase the, the amount of speed at which I'm able to draw backgrounds. Yeah. But oh, yeah. The uh, the perspective tool. Like there, there's a couple of those things. Like you can set up like three or four. I don't know how many. You probably an infinite number of vanishing points on here and everything draws right to that vanishing point. Like that's pretty cool. You know, like doing buildings and stuff like that. Um, you mean in real life, though, John? Don't you? You mean like a ruler that you put on the screen? Oh yeah, that's what I yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, right. I like a, a ruler with like a felt bottom, but I, 
um, to where I can place the ruler physically over my screen or an ellipse tool or whatever else physically on my screen and just draw like I was drawing traditional. That way I don't get lost in the settings. Like, why didn't yeah. that work the way I wanted it to work? Or what happened to my ruler tool? Where did it go? You know, I can just grab one True. from off my desk, throw it on here, boop, ruler. Oh, nice. Yeah, mixing the uh, traditional with the digital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the, for the built-in ruler, yeah, that's great. And the uh, perspective tool is really cool. There's like a focus line thing. I've used that before. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are good things in there if you want, if you want to fiddle around in, in the uh, software. Um, and John, you mentioned you, you might do some drawing. How, mm. How's that going? Oh, well, uh, I, I, I don't know if it's really necessary, but um, let's see. Should we it's not right? necessary, but I'm sure everyone would love it. Okay, uh, I did a share screen there. Can you guys see that? You can see it. Oh, I'm excited now. Okay. <laughs> um i don't know what do you want me to draw um i don't know um let's see if you have questions for john in the chat be sure to post them now there's a wonderful opportunity to have one of the pros uh pros here but um a lot of the time we do get questions about how to lay out a, a comic book page hmm. have you got any uh insights on that uh, sure um you know i i see a lot you know everybody getting super fancy and I got to have this and that and, and, and all this stuff going on. These crazy panels like this. And <clears throat> I'll, I'll talk about this more than I'm going to draw it. Uh, what I was oh, going to yeah. show you guys real quick is there's a thing called like rule of thirds. And it's uh, you oh, take yeah. a left angle, you cut it down, doom, doom. And basically what it is is you want kind of like uh, your interesting thing to kind of fall on these lines. Uh, so here's a guy standing. Uh, this one actually, this or this one actually end up being pretty good defaults for like a horizon line. So if we got rid of this line right here, so now we got a guy and then, you know, you can just fudge around. So here's a sun and that can help you to find like good spots for like composition. Now all of a sudden totally. it looks like you got almost a, a binary sunset kind of type. And do you do that at every panel, John? Like, no, no, no. Um, but, but I go back to these things when something isn't kind of setting right, you know, and you're like, how, why can't I get, like, a good composition on this stuff? Um, I'm also very cautious that, like, um, I, I, I look for balance a lot. This thing's not twisting for me now, of course. It's going to do this. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. So if... if Here's something I ran across recently. Okay. Yep. Someone had drawn a moon. Um, but when they did the, the when they did the panel border, it was like this. Okay. Oh. Now, what would your gripe be with this? It's a little bit off. It, it seems a little bit off center. Mm-hmm. Well, it is, but it's also, it's this tangent. <laughs> it's that this line touches the, 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 the circle. So okay. um, what my suggestion was is to move the line off the circle, but it's not just like you find any kind of random spot to move it. For me, it was take the distance from here and here and duplicate that exact distance here to here for balance. And I would also say, in this case, because it was such a simple panel, um, you know, keep this distance the same here and here. Like that, that's like a perfectly framed object. Now you can go crazy. Obviously, you could do a moon where it's coming off like here, but that's not what the artist chose. The artist chose that. So I just said, hey, just tweak that a little bit to there. And uh, now we don't have that weird tangent of the moon touching the top of the border. And now we have this nice, pleasant shape. I, I think of things like a lot of times when I'm drawing, I'll think of things oddly. It's weird, but for me, it's like stained glass. And when I when I'm because everything's a shape. Um, let's say this is a tie. All right, there's a tie. There's a jacket. Like everything's a shape. Here's something's neck goes off to his shoulder, but like this is a shape. So even in this shape, I want to have, I want to be thinking of it like balance this way. Like if I was like, mm -hmm. you know, 
a real draftsman. It'd be like everything would be perfect. And the closer you get all these nice little balances to where everything is perfect, one, you run the risk of being boring. But yep. two, you 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 have the opportunity to become Travis Charest. So you you have to find a balance between that. But what I look for or what I'm thinking about when I'm when I'm doing this stuff, like I, I'd want it first of all, I'd see this is sloppy. I, I want to make this whole thing like this shape here needs mm-hmm. to be the same. So like I, I need it to yep. mirror. Like I, it's got to have that almost perfect symmetry to it. And Man, I love that. All right, you don't um, have to hear about this stuff. But I'm, yeah. I noticed that I pay attention to that kind of thing as well when I draw. I've just never really noticed it before. Yeah. So I mean, you, you just, I don't know, you're trying to lock everything in properly. And, but sometimes like, you know, there'll be, something might be off a little bit and like you get a little thin area in here for some reason while you're drawing. And I think about it like stained glass. I'm like, would the, would the glass be so thin and brittle that it just breaks? If it is, do I need it? You know? So then you just, you know, you simplify. Yeah. Just simplify everything, get everything into its spot where it belongs. Um, but you'll find it like, you know, when, you know, small little areas between like even, you know, a, a figure and another one. And you're like, well, if this is stained glass and now I have to carve a little stained glass to get through here, is that too thin? Um, maybe I'm just better off cutting this thing behind this guy. Mm-hmm. So now I just need stained glass that goes, oops, with that piece and a stained glass for this. No, like without this little thing here and a stained glass for that piece, nice, big, solid, sturdy pieces of glass. Um, again, like I said, it, it's, it's probably a little bit more, uh, me, <laughs> but for me, all this makes, it makes a lot of sense for me and all, yeah. all this stuff is very important to me. Got a quick question. How do you feel about pushing anatomy in order to make something more dynamic? Yeah, um, you know, you can you can draw something so far that it breaks, um, or you can have something so proper that it's boring. But if you put something in the middle there, that's best. Would you mind giving us a, a quick uh, demonstration of how you go about constructing a, a basic female figure, John? Mm. I know that's a big ask. Maybe no. like a question that that lots of people want to know. Okay, well, I mean. You know, basically, you want to have an hourglass, uh, some pointy legs. <laughs> oh, cool. So you start with the the outside no, shape. No, 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 no. This is uh, yeah. this is like kind of the essence, I, I guess. You know, I mean, the, the <laughs> silhouette. Um, but when I'm drawing, what what I do is, and I've done this a lot when I've been on drawing shows. Is I show it is. Um, and, and how to draw the Marvel way will actually show you a little bit about this. It's, uh, it, it's, cool. it's doodling. I remember this. Yeah. Draw it nice and light and just scribble and, and get all the stuff down. You want to get, you want to get like that form down more than anything else before you kind of lose it. You know, you don't want to start thinking about, well, here's the structure because what happens is, is you, you lose sight of, of that energy that you were going for. So yeah, yeah. Don't don't commit to any line. Just kind of get it all down. You know, cool. there's some boobs in there somewhere. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Maybe you'll find them. Um, if you're doing this on paper, I recommend you do it extremely light. And I mean real light. Like you think you're going light, but you're not going light enough. Do it to where you're barely seeing the line. Keep scribbling. And eventually the form will kind of reveal itself to you. Um, definitely, you know, I mean, there you know, it's a lot of practice, years of practice, but eventually you start making decisions on what's the proper line and what's not. Mm-hmm. And then after you think you kind of got the essence of it all, let's see, let's get it. Let's get some pelvis stuff going on in there. Pelvis action. Yeah. So now we can start kind of breaking down a little bit more of, you know, your basic fundamental shapes, but it's still all kind of hidden in there. Um, do, 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 do. Looks great already. Yeah, her arms. I, I tend to give people like gorilla arms. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, if you know, I hear the hips are 
to the elbow and here i mean you see it in, with like lilith and like uh one of those graveyard shift pages they had up earlier um awesome. i understand it's bad but uh you know i'll 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 debate it as i'm going through the process of how much i want to fix something up or kind of just leave it you know uh walt simonson did pinheads all the time and then they were terrible pinheads but what happened was was they were so bad but they they just came up to like kind of that uncanny valley um where it made people look like gods or like, you know, Roman statues or like, you know, uh, Michelangelo's David, you know, that kind of pinhead, but huge body on it makes it look, make them look tough. But if you go too small, if you go too small, it's always better to go smaller head than bigger head. You don't want to have like a bulbous head, but um, if you go a little bit smaller than what is actually real, you get a cool head. Like all of a sudden that guy looks really tough and uh, heroic. Um, but if you go too small, you'll lose. And trust me, I've I've drawn plenty of people with their pinheads just uh, way too small. So totally. the center line. That's such a cool way of doing it. Um, I haven't seen this myself, so this is cool. It's really fun. Yeah, and uh, so in Manga Studio, we can just turn that and click it all to blue. Then I bring it down to whatnot. Um, and it's like, when I'm doing actual drawing, I start with my, my settings. I use this little 30, I think it's 30 pixels, whatever it is. And, mm -hmm. uh, I, I would probably go tighter than this, especially on like the face, but just for demonstration purposes. Yep. Um, 30 is pretty good. I, I don't zoom in too far because cool. like I've told Elliot Fernandez, like Elliot Fernandez, he'll get in like this to, to draw and you'll never get it done. Like, yeah. um, don't zoom in like. For the most part, any bigger than the actual size of the paper would be. So if I had an 11 by 17 inch piece of paper on top of this computer right now, it would probably size to right around there. So I would definitely not want to get any closer than that because I'm wasting my time. Um, our, our pages are going to reduce. So I, I pull out right now. I'm at uh, what am I at? I'm at 20 percent of actual size. That's so, awesome. Yeah, and that might even be a little too close for where I'm at right now. So I might even zoom out here. And do you normally jump from this basic rough foundational sketch straight to inks, John? Um, depending, like the body here, I think I, I would be pretty comfortable kind of going where I'm at. Um, but the face, I would need a lot more going on uh, information-wise. So, um, But trust me, if you do all the work in like this rough stuff, like that, that's 90% of the work, you know, like even if you, you know, go in there and, and start getting, you know, drawing in the face and treating it like a pencil, but not spending, you know, forever on it. Um, it it's yeah. a good way to go. There's a bit more energy in it. Actually, we got a, uh, a question from Jimmy mm -hmm. and, and I thought it was a good one. He said, uh, John, do you feel too much structure stiffens up figures and design? How do you feel about loose gesture drawings? Yeah. Um, look, you know, like it's kind of like the Holy Grail would be, well, one, you want to be Travis Ray. But on the other hand, you want to go in there and, you know, if you've ever seen like the Matrix, they had a, this animated thing like the Animatrix. And there was one thing, one section of this kind of anthology cartoon. And uh, what it is, is they, they drew like this guy going th through the skateboard scene and through his hallway and all that. And the whole thing is sketchy. And it really motivated me because I was like, man, I just wish I could draw like that. And that's kind of like uh, on a certain level why I like uh, Narwhal, like this fluidity about him. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those arms are way too long. But anyways. Um, it happens. Yeah. We so all have our digital. So especially, you know, look, I mean, you know, boom, you lasso them, slide them up. Yeah. Right out there. So uh, basically uh, you got to be able to like, Grab your crotch. So if you can do that, you're you're all right. But you don't want to touch your knees. No. <laughs> Rule of thumb. Like same thing with spacing. Uh, when I when I'm drawing like a nose, um, and a mouth, and I'm like, how much distance between here? Uh, you know, instead of like these big measurements, I, I kind of come up with these retarded ways of figuring things out. And I'm like, well, you need to be able to get your finger in there, so you can <laughs> give yourself a little fake mustache. It's true. So that's that's how you know how much room you need for the divot. You got to be able to get a finger in there. That works really well. Did you invent that, John? Um, I don't know. I might have. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's just it, it, it's a retarded way of doing things. Um, yeah, but it works. It works. 
she's a powerful looking chick already man and and that's you know it there's no design in here there's no rendering or anything like that but all the important information has already been established yeah yeah and guys i what i was trying to get to earlier is if you do <clears throat> all the work here like doing the work in the inking kind of type phase and and filling in all the holes that can take you a long time when you get to somewhere like even the face like this is not enough information for me to do a face on ethan van skyver he could do one on there and it would turn out gold 99 percent of the time me that doesn't work and as long as oops as long as i'm on this blue line again i don't want to spend a lot of time doing it but yep. really scratchy get the information in there because I can't draw this fast in the inking phase. I can't figure this stuff out and go through the trial and error. And if I just try to wing it, I find myself taking five times longer to figure out how to draw a phase because I'm trying to do this. Eyeball. Eyeball. Now, I, I have the information down there now. But trying to get this, guess this stuff and get it right it yeah. can take a long time if, if you're just eyeballing all this information down. This one's actually turned out okay. So Yeah, it's pretty good <laughs> for something that, yeah, that you just uh, did up there in, what, two seconds? Yeah, but that's if, if I did anything, hopefully I proved my point. <laughs> Get you some did. of that information down there. And, uh, you know, even with the hair, you know, don't just try to free ball all this stuff in the inks. You'll, you'll be wasting a lot of your time. Get this stuff down here. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. Just get the kind of the shapes in there, a little bit of the direction in the hair. And then if you want to kind of, you know, go in here and, and you know, oh, what I want a big wisp kind of coming up like there. Or, well, I'd like to change the direction here. And, you know, these are easier decisions to make in, instead of trying to figure out this whole shape in mm. the phase. So do it in that rough phase. And uh, if you're doing it on pencil, uh, you know, do it all light, and uh, then then you make then you make these decisions that I'm doing with the black line here, with a firmer touch on your pencil, or a uh, you would switch from like I don't know what it is, like a hard to a lead or a light, whatever it is. The the lead, you know, one of them comes out really dark, the other one comes off really soft. So, totally. Yeah. And how long does it take you to to do a page, John? Generally. Um, I'm comfortable with about two days. So that's what I like. And, um, but I can do them in a day. I mean, I, you know, I worked for Marvel. I, I can just get it done. Um, but that's not, that's not really what I want. But he, oh, even with Marvel, I was probably closer to like a, a five or six week schedule. So, um, yeah, right. Yeah. I'm loving this, John, by the way. Thank you. you. Know. Her, neck, her neck's a little long, but um, let's see here. It down there now that looks great man like you can tell you're a pro even at this stage just the way in which you, you lay down those lines so loosely and, and seem to nail it i think i noticed that mostly with the hair sometimes it's hard to capture a good shape that, that you know describes the, the silhouette in an interesting way yeah um a lot you know i I've drawn a, a, a chick, a, you know, a bazillion times. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, sure. rep repetition matters. Um, I'm becoming an old dude, even though I have a youthful voice and look to me. Uh, <laughs> I'm becoming an old man quickly. So um, <clears throat> draw, you know, draw as, you know, as often as you can. Um, if, if it's a chore to you, if it's something you don't want to do, uh, a drawing career is probably not necessarily the thing you want to do. Um, but if you need to motivate yourself because of the opportunity to come in here and potentially make money and it's something you, you know, um, think about, think about the shit jobs that are out there mm. like construction and factory yeah. jobs and, and let that motivate you, um, to doing something. We've got a question from skull diamond. Probably we can, we can ask everyone on the panel. What is your favorite part about making comics? John can kick us off. For me, I everything. <laughs> uh, I'm I, I know I'm retarded, guys, but when it comes to comics, I 
you know, sometimes I'm like, who am I to even think about what looks good and what not? Like, but I, it's like two parts of me. Like one part of me is always second guessing, like, who the fuck do you think you are? <laughs> you know? Um, but the other part of me is gung ho and is like, well, this is what I like. This is what I think. And, you know, like, like I tried to express earlier, every part of it is so important to me. Um, you know, some people draw and that's all they do. That's all they care. And they let the writer do the writing. They let the letterer do the lettering. Um, you know, and, and look, you know, it's great. If you can find that like fantastic, just everybody on there is exactly on the same page you are, then great. I mean, everything should come out perfect, but that's like a one in a million situation. Um, to, to find a team where everybody is on that same page. And I have so many opinions um, on how everything should be and look. With Graveyard Shift, I'm involved from beginning to end, essentially, in terms of uh, definitely on the art side, um, the, the, the final look of everything, how everything's put together. You know, I let Mark largely take care of his writing. But like I said, we have these this phase at the end where all of us will sit in there and we'll say, how do we kind of – tweak this can we make give this a little more punch or whatnot and uh, mark uh, figure something figure out a new line here get it back to us tomorrow we're going to put it in again um so cool though that like it just sounds like awesome yeah so i mean the coloring uh when i get colors back from the colorist i actually color over them <laughs> then i send them back because it's too hard <laughs> to explain what i want and uh, I, I just say, Z, make it look like this. And he says, oh, okay. And that's great because, like, I, I've colored my own work before, but it's it's a pain. So it, it takes a lot of work to get up to one point. But then for someone – and I, I was talking to Dan Frega and Pat Lee the other day on, on a stream about this colorist named Drew. And I asked him because I had heard that this was the case. I wasn't, And I wasn't sure uh, if it was true or not. But Rob – and it might have been Rob that told me this, but Rob – would have his coloring department do the coloring, but he had this one guy he trusted that could take that stuff and lift it and elevate it. And that guy was Drew and Drew's passed away now, but he was such a great talent. He was the guy that gave that final pass. So um, in a way, and look, I, I could be right. I could be wrong. I don't know, but in a way I'm, I'm the Drew for everything. <laughs> and like, I want to go in there and I want to be sure that logo is the best that it can be. Um, those, the look, I can't necessarily make the logo. So I find someone that knows how to do it. And if I can look at it and say, well, what if we try this? And then they send back two, three options or whatever the case may be. And I say, that's it. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, including the graveyard shift logo, um, we cover that in the back of volume ones, the, the different steps we went through it. Another guy had done it. I, I, I threw in my suggestions, including dropping in the logo in there. And uh, that became what is now the Graveyard Shift logo. Um, but it wouldn't have been that if I had just said, hey, good enough. Mm. And um, you, yeah. actually, I think in the book, actually, I have the book. Um, let me. Oh, cool. I'm trying to think. We can talk more about get Graveyard Shift as well if you, you've got the time to stick around as well, John, like uh, including Graveyard Shift 3. I'm pretty intrigued about that. I signed up to the list the other day. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, let me see. Let me see if I can turn this on. I'm, I'm going to have this sitting on my desk and tell me if you guys can see this or not. Okay, cool. We can see it. Um, where is it? it is. Okay. That's that's what would have been the Graveyard Shift logo. It's fine, right? It's not terrible. Um, what I liked was uh, the bottom text. I thought that was a lot sharper than that kind of gothic-y stuff. The skull wasn't I was in love with, but I had already been designing the logo. Mm. So originally, we were going to have that upside down crucifix on uh, every page, and I'm. But then I was like, I'm like, well, that's a lot. <laughs> so we were gonna we were gonna be splitting the artwork on uh, on either side of that original uh, what are bar. Um, so again, for design, we're just like too much. Um, but what we got. In the end was our logo, which I think turned out pretty pretty swell. Yeah, it looks um, cool. Trial and error. Uh, I'm not perfect, and uh, but I but I work with people that hopefully are you know talented and able to execute what I can't. But like with the coloring stuff, 
there's so much work that goes in there. But when you're coloring, like you tend to forget certain things, like some of the basic things, like um, values, um, you know, with darker tones to push things into the foreground or background, and then mid tones in the middle, lighter tones, again, foreground or background. Um, a lot of times I see that even in comic skate books uh, being completely ignored. Um, uh, warm yeah. tones and cool tones. Uh, a lot of times uh, I see people color and it's, <coughs> excuse me, coronavirus. It's like paint by numbers. It's, uh, well, this is meant to be red, so I colored it red. This is meant to be yellow, so I colored it yellow. This is meant to be green, so I colored it green. Uh, and it just looks like a coloring book at the end of the day. Whereas none of the colors are kind of marrying into like the sun um, or, or they're not taking on any of the blue tones of the night. And mm -hmm. uh, again, all these things become important to me. So when, when I get colors back, that's kind of what I'm doing. I like Graveyard Shift 3. Most of the stuff I did because there's so many like night scenes was I added blue layers over top all the colors. And then I just color, I erased out all the warm spots and, uh, you know, the best colors in the world are, you know, cool blues and warm oranges or yellows. Oh, yeah. They're, they're very complementary to each other. So, um, yeah, actually Clayton, you kind of got that orange blue <laughs> palette in your uh, camera. Very dynamic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah totally. It's coming up on one side of your face and you got that warm tone on the other side of your face. Like that visually is appealing to people. And uh, so that's what I do. I go through the art and I'm looking for warm tones, cool tones, and how I can push things forward or backwards through value and uh, also hues. And uh, in the end, we get whatever we end up with. So um, it's, it's as best as I can do. I'm not great. And uh, then I go and do the same thing with the lettering. Um, I, I'm sitting in, you know, many hours with Eric and uh, he'll tell you I'm, I'm annoying. I'm like, can you just click it up? You know, it's like your your wife or your mom when you're a kid. Like, um, move that picture frame just a little more left. You know, up one inch. That's basically what I do when, with Eric. Is I'm I'm like, because again, I'm I'm trying to find that perfect spot for it without without co covering up art unless we have no choice and keeping everything within the panel is also very important to me. There's a time to break a panel with the lettering. Um, but if you do it left and right and all the time, it looks sloppy. So um, keeping everything in the frame, like the picture frame, the panel, um, that's where you want to like have that that really great execution of composition with your word balloons, your art, your everything being uh, three dimensional as best as you can execute that. Um, and then if you have if you have a moment, like even Grave Air Shift Three, I think we probably have maybe two maybe three instances of like a balloon going into another panel. But even then we do it very carefully, a lot of thought, uh, make sure that we're not breaking the panel before the eye has finished skimming the artwork all the way down to the bottom. So it has to be done very carefully. Absolutely. Is there a chance that we might be able to get a little sneak peek at graveyard shift three, John? Ooh. Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, so close. Fire up my computer. I'm gonna I'm gonna hop in here on a different account. So, like I said, I'm on the uh, mobile studio, and I think all my graveyard graveyard shift stuff is on my main computer. So I'm firing this up right now. Oh, sweet! I'm going to hop in to the waiting room with oh, that, sweet. and then I'm gonna turn this computer off. So you'll see me drop out of here pretty quick. Okay, cool, man. No worries. Well, we'll give you a chance to do that. Okay. All right. Cool. How crazy! <laughs> man. What a what a great stream. John is so um, inspirational. He like uh, makes you want to just reach just that little bit higher. Oh yeah, man. Absolutely. He's uh, he's definitely an awesome dude. Is he back mm. already? Is he? Already. I'm back. I'm back. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> <laughs> just listening to the compliments being thrown your way. Yeah, yeah no, I know. I appreciate you want him to hear them straight away. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a preview, but I'm going to do it through uh, some of these um, coloring cool. samples. Just to kind of give you guys an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, nice. Let's see. 
And I'm looking forward to this book. I reckon it'll be badass. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. Hope everyone's digging it. Um, I got to be sure I'm also not getting too spoilery. Oh, yeah, of course. We don't want any spoilers. We don't want to ruin it. Make sure um, you sign up to John's mailing list. In The link's in chat, and it's also in the description of the video uh, for Graveyard Shift 3. Yeah, yeah, this is definitely not one to miss, guys. <laughs> I unfortunately missed it. the first two campaigns for Graveyard Shift. I don't know how or why, but I caught the uh, the Andrew Hoyter uh, variant cover version, so I'm happy about that. Yeah. Okay. Malin Malin says it's definitely worth me skipping maths class. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh Absolutely. okay. You guys can see that. All right. Cool. We can. Yeah. Wow. All right. So this is an example of like the process that I go through um, behind the scenes. And let me see if I can pull it up. On okay. Here we go. All right. So over here, if you guys can see my cursor, these are the originals. Uh, the original colors, and mm -hmm. then on the right are my do-overs. And so basically you can see, like, uh, like if we want panel to panel, look at this one, for example. This is a guy's coming out of fire. This is actually meant to be a fireball. Um, this is a little bit of what I mean by kind of like the paint by number. It, it's meant to be this color. Like, that's these are the appropriate colors. Um, appropriate colors for the windows, the suit, the cape. Um, but none of the heat, none of the, none of the fire, none of that is kind of like getting in here. So what I do is I go over it, as you can see here, and I'm like, well, here's basically my correction. Um, here's the, uh, what I'm going for. Boop -a -doop -a -doop, doo -doo -doo. And then I send this stuff off to Z, my colorist, and then he gets it as close as he can to what I was, what I was aiming for. And even here is an example of, uh, the warm tones moving into the cool tones. If you see that orange blues, uh, nice. overexposing all this stuff to, to, so here it's like you have, you know, motorcycle car. It looks okay. Everything is done. Well, it, it's, it's showing what it needs to show, but now it's on fire. You guys can yeah. kind of see what I'm saying. You like there's heat. Them. They're part of this kind of inferno now, like they're in it. So these are these are my notes. Uh, a lot of times it's about simpli simplification. So in the original book, we I think we ended up he used we showed the inside of the ship and it, it was all yellows. Um, here we have it. It's red. It's green. It's blue. And this is fine. Um, but also just having it just yellow is simple. <laughs> so um, I you know I, I put a blue hue over these guys and. Uh, you know, I prettied up these windows a bit and tried to make this all like this back sky have a little bit more oomph to it, show a little bit more stars. And then Z goes by and, and, and he'll do it and he'll do like, he'll make it look great. And th that's what I expect. I don't expect them to copy me. I expect them to make it look better at all times. Mm. So um, that's what you get with like a really good colorist that that is out there uh, willing to put up with my bullshit. <laughs> and uh, hopefully at the end, we have a much better project for it. I, and I think that if uh, if it didn't end up reflecting well on him, I think he would probably walk as a colorist. So, uh, guys, don't just do needless things. That's why I show people. Because when I show them, I, I think it's a lot easier than, I, how do you type this out? Mm. <laughs> so, oh, you, you can't. I like I mean, the second panel as well. Like, it looks a lot better than uh, page two, panel two. Looks a lot better, in my opinion. Yeah, that one. With the the reflection on the windows of the fire, yeah. it's great. Yeah, it's you know it's creating the environment. It, these these things exist and are lit by this. Mm. So um, you you can't just have you know that. And you know Z when he did it, he might not even realize that this was still the kind of inferno stuff. I mean, he put this little texture in there. I don't know. It looks more like um, a mood. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's what he thought it was. It could have been a, a, a two moons behind each other. Um, but yeah, now now it's all incorporated. Now now it all kind of belongs. And uh, you know, even here, every, everywhere in here, we, we you know we carefully plotted out word balloons. And I, I like this little guy. I don't think he had it. And there's a little guy right here, and that's him standing next to the car. And I don't think like he had a line. And I think what we ended up doing is we made like one word balloon with like a question mark, like maybe question mark exclamation point 
then we colored the question mark and made it look kind of like a Todd McFarlane kind of spawn type thing. Uh, nice. We also do that a lot. I mean, when, when we hired Eric, um, that was in like the request. We're looking for someone that can do a Todd McFarlane spawn level uh, Tom Orzakowski um, lettering. And Eric ended up doing pretty much exactly what we wanted on like one sample and was hired. And through that, I recommended him out to everyone. And now he works for everyone and more. So, um, yeah. yeah. So he, he he did a home run. He he wasn't sitting there asking, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, he just did it. Like he didn't have like when we he grabbed the page from the campaign um had no script and what he did was he just made up word balloons on top of that jpeg and he put in the lyrics to like metallica one <laughs> so um it was great it was actually that page where that you showed earlier uh clayton with the uh the guy holding the uh torch yeah cool. yeah so eric lettered that to metallica one and then like the uh last last panel with the skeleton and i think it was he uh he did the uh Oh God help me, I think it was. And so the skeleton was saying, Oh God help me. I was like, oh shit, that's funny. It was funny, it was clever. He 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 did different things with the fonts that were completely in line with old, you know, spawn number one, two, three. Um, it was a great job, and boom, he got hired on that. And uh, so you know, that that's always been kind of the thing for this book was like we want to be we want to get like that kind of spawn experience of, and I think even Todd was like a stickler for all these different things as well. Lettering, coloring, fonts, design. So, um, yeah. you got to have that eye for detail. And especially when you're working with colorists, with letterers, when you, you know, you'll be the brains behind the operation and you can spot that stuff out and, and help them do a better, better job then you get that yet a final definitive product at the end that you know is the best that it can be. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm trying to look one more time. Um, I, have a, I have a sneaky question, John. Um, the trading card that you've got done, can mm -hmm. we say that? <laughs> oh, um, trading cards are on the tablet. So oh, um, I, I don't, I don't want to hop back to that. Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I mean, oh, um, I do have, I don't know if I have them handy. I have like three that were already printed and oh. uh, then we're waiting on uh, Mark sending out the files for two more trading cards. So, um, yeah. Is he, who's designing your trading cards, Mark? Um, no, we use, uh, I, I'm going to butcher his last name. It's like Ryan Arenato. Arna He's our pre-press oh, yeah. guy. I'm, I'm he, sorry, he yeah. yeah, he does everything for us. So, um, okay. you know, if we need design in like the back of Graveyard Shift, he puts that together. He's a great guy. Uh, I recommend him out to everyone. Uh, let him know that you're coming from me, though. That way he knows that, uh, you know, that I'm putting the good word out there for him. But uh, <laughs> show us all the things. Um, <laughs> oh, let me see it one last time. People seem really buzzed for the book, man. Yeah, I appreciate that. The, 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 um we're waiting on Canada now because what happened was we sent books off to China. The pandemic happened. They shut down our printers in China. And I grabbed the last book, the main book, volume two, because I thought, because it was actually behind the other ones, I thought I could speed it up and save, you know, a month. And uh, so I, I pulled it and I sent it off to Canada. And then right after I sent it to Canada, Canada shut down. Uh, <laughs> I was like, no. So I, I I tried to speed up the process. I I don't think I hurt the time. I think I just I didn't improve the time. I think I would I at the end of the day, I think I'm gonna get them about the same time as I would have through China. Um and, and when do you think that'll be? Uh within 30 days. Oh, cool. Yeah, I, I think we'll be shipping within 30 days. No, so I'm it, yeah, I'm excited for that. Close. Um I'm I'm trying to zoom in one more time. I'm probably gonna have to do like a straight up screen share with you guys because I'm yeah for sure. I want to show you how much better Z makes this stuff because I don't want Yo. it to look like Z's not doing the work because he totally is. Um, well, we Guess how many uh, mailing list signups John's got already, Clayton? Have a have a have a, have a, have a, have a no, I can have uh, a guess. 
man. Probably seven hundred. What's oh on the mail the mailing list? How many people I got on there? Over a thousand. I, I broke a thousand, I think, yesterday. Hell so, yeah. Yeah, so it, it's doing pretty well. All right, hold on. Sorry, I gotta I gotta zoom in. And I'm so trying not much. to share my desktop and different files and oh, it's okay. We're all Top. Yeah, I mean, we won't, we won't dissect your desktop and work out what's happening. Right. There's a code here, you know. There's some secret Easter eggs. <laughs> <laughs> Graveyard shit for you three on Malin's desktop. Um, by the way, everybody watching right now, this is the sign-up page, the pre-launch page for Graveyard Shift Volume 3 graphic novel. Check it out. We've got a link in the description below this video. Um, you know, Re Re Replicator is popping it up every now and then as well. Sign up to the email list. You know, there's there's really no commitment here except to, to just keep in the loop on, on everything that's happening with it. So this one's worth keeping an eye on. And you get a sick uh, trading card when you back. Yeah. Oh, this is not showing my... It's uh, not showing your other ones. We're like... Time. Matrix. <laughs> um, is that any different? Can you see the pages? Yeah, that's different. That's different. Okay. All right. Let me see if this works. This on the right. These are my corrections. Uh, you cool. can see it's it's a little. The colors are a little garish because I'm just coloring. I'm throwing it down, and then we go right here and Z. Th these are the finals. Now, if you remember that, what that old background looked like. Uh, actually, I can show you. Here we go. That's the original that Z turned in. This is the final. Now looking like these colors, like the blue, it looks wet. Like mm, looks yeah. Like uh, the, the, the pink in here is killed out. Um, we have this nice one tone, simple. And I, and I tell people colors all the time, don't overcomplicate your colors. Keep them, keep them simple, man. And uh, like color, you know, costumes, you don't have to have, you know, don't use two different uh, tones of green for two different, you know, Items use the same tone of green uh, for one green for the same green for the belt as the boots. <laughs> you know, it's like old school comic book stuff. It's real simple. You'd be, you'd be surprised how many people want to just use different colors like they're ADD and uh, just kind of spurging on the colors. Uh, blue. And eh, let's see. What do we got? OK, originally it was blue. Then I had them go to yellow here for the heads up display. Um Probably because it was just yellow. <laughs> so um, let's see. Here's the uh, multicolored control panel. Again, not bad, but we had already set up an issue one that yellow was like our thing. So yellow, 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 nice and yellow. Um, but even just, I mean, the simplicity here. And, and this is what I tell everyone, guys. You don't even have to be like a great colorist, um, especially for night scenes. You can take a layer, put it over top, put it to multiply, um, and then just erase out the hot spots, and you can almost pull off this kind of look every time on a figure. Uh, you'd erase out the highlights here, you know, use like a kind of an airbrush eraser, um, then send it back to your colorist, and and it's gonna go from this to this. Yeah, so it's a real simple trick, and daylight is, is kind of the same. You you can do it with a red, <laughs> you know, um, and, and you can give everybody this kind of like here I, I i don't have the before and after on here but i have the after and the after because these were done later in the process um but you know this this is all stuff that was my contribution like burning out you know the this uh the ship here castle dracula with that warm tone Vroom. then we get this cool tone over here going to the warm tones again um going over the artwork here um mm. marrying all this stuff putting making making it warm Throwing red. A lot of times people use like a, almost like a corpse like color for skin tone. Don't forget to add some red and then just, you know, let that kind of sit in there somewhere. And, you know, you maybe turn your opacity down a certain degree, but there's blood under the skin. Um, yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah. Beautiful work. Great. Great. All right. So, so, um, that's about it. I'm, oops. Hold on, let me stop sharing before you guys see crazy files. <laughs> oh. All right, I'll have there. to go back and then I'll have that later, Rob. Yeah, for sure. Um, do you, I've got a couple no, of questions. How, how much do you like? Do you plan out 
uh, your campaigns? Like, are you after a certain amount of backers? Are you after a certain dollar amount? Do you set yourself goals? How do you, how do you work? How do you sort all that stuff out? Well, um, first of all, I, I approach like the campaign page, same as I would a book. And people I've talked to, look, they, they might think I'm a little bit anal. I am. Uh, everything matters. I, I, I try to keep it quick. I try to keep it simple. Um, I, I want you to see the art and I want you to get over there to click the uh, tiers as quickly as possible. Uh, the featured tier is a really cool thing. Don't worry, guys. I'm not selling anything. These aren't for sale right now. Um, but the featured tier there, I put that I, I put that up. Um, wait, what campaign is this? Oh, that's it's Australian. Uh, I was like, when did I put a hundred and seventeen dollar yeah. tier up there? That's a seventy five dollar oh. tier, I believe. So um, that like I, I the feature tier should be the one that it, it's a little bit more expensive, but it's going to give the backer the kind of the most bang for their buck. Um, mm. I'm on my I'm going on my third campaign now, but here I was on my second. So in the middle there is the book. To the left of it is a reprint of volume one, so you can get caught up on the whole story. Then to the right, it's supplemental. Um, everything you need <laughs> right there. Um, yeah. But in, in terms of the campaigns, it's like you want to get stuff for you know people who don't have a lot of money. So you get a twenty five dollar tier. That's the book. Uh, yeah, people want a little bit extra or they, if they missed out on the other one, you know, $75, it's not outrageous. Um, but you want to have prices for everybody. So I, I really don't recommend anyone having any tier under uh, $25 or that I can think of offhand. Start at 25. Awesome. I don't do digital. The books are special. Those are what matter. And those are, I want people to have the experience of a physical comic book. And, um, you know, and then have tiers that go up into higher amounts that, you know, people with deeper pockets because they like to spend a little bit more to get a little bit more like sketches, yeah. original art or whatever the case may be. Ethan had a tier. I think I mentioned earlier that was like a ten thousand dollar tier for a cover. Somebody dropped that, you know, and said, yeah, I got 10 grand. Here you go. Plop. So oh there are God. people out there with really deep pockets who have nothing better to do than to have someone come up and say, hey, here's a reason why you should buy this. And then they say, hmm, sure, why not? And then they buy it. You might be surprised. So have something uh, really attractive tiers, you know, up to $100 tiers, $250 tiers. And uh, yeah, I think uh, like I had just told somebody recently, keep your book stuff up front or up top and then have your merchandise kind of below that. Keep things organized. Don't let it look like a fucking yard sale where you got like a really nice watch next to like an ashtray, a used ashtray. And then you got something cool further down the line. Keep it like books. And then you get to your merchandise. And, and whenever you're selling merchandise, you better be selling a book with that merchandise. Uh, we're in the yeah. comic book business. We're not in the t-shirt or the hat business. We want the comics in your hands because it, it's not going to be the t-shirt that'll bring you back. We want to bring you back on the book. So be sure you have a book option that's attached to any kind of merchandise option. And uh, yeah, you guys can see there. I mean, these, these are all pretty simple. I, I keep everything in the tiers because uh, so when you click on that or when you look at the tier, you can see exactly what's in there. It, it's, it's spelt out for people as simple as possible um, in the yeah. image. And then if you need the description, then you click on it and then you have the information in there as well. But the image in the tier tells you everything. So, um, yeah. like all these stretch goal things that you see on the left where they're all bolded, like those aren't even there when I launched the campaign. I just kind of add a stretch goal as I come up with them because I, I don't want people to be reading shit. I want them to look at the art. I'm selling you this candy bar. Um, here's the gist of it. Would you like to buy? And that's it. So, Hell yeah, man. but everything okay. matters. The, 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 just like a comic book page and the, and the font and, Everything, um, all that, it has to be elegant. The art has to, as we go from one page to another page, there should be a, a nice, decent flow between the pages and, uh, you know, an, an aesthetic there. It, it, again, if it looks like a yard sale and you got a different colorist and a different technique, and it's not meant to be that way because it's sequential or whatnot, if it looks like you just hacked it together, don't expect to get a $100,000 uh campaign unless you have look if you have subs of yeah 60,000 or more 
You mm-hmm. can do almost anything you want. You don't have to listen to me at all in terms of your campaign because people are going to back it for the same reason that you have 60,000 subs because people like you, they respect you, and they want to they want to reward you. So they're going to go in there and they're going to grab something doesn't matter. But for everyone else like myself, I have under 10,000 subs. Um, I do believe this stuff is important. And mm. even if I had 100,000 subs, I would still believe it's important because I'm retarded like that. Mm. <laughs> so um, I, really I would still do this. Too, right? Yeah, I would still do each one of these as elegantly as I can. Um, you know, show people the action, the drama, um, make them be like, ooh, this is going to happen in here. Look at that big fucking werewolf. <laughs> so, this is an awesome panel, man. At yeah. age. So sick. Yeah. So, yeah, everything matters. I mean, that's kind of my philosophy. In the end of the day, I don't care how you get to wherever you're going. It's execution. If you can pull off the execution of it, um, you'll do very well. Uh, You want to make $100,000 plan, not what you want to do, but what you think is going to be the most commercially successful. You know, like I remember one time, like there was some little thing uh, people, someone wanted to make like the most commercial uh, song or something like that. And they just did like a real simple beep, you know, beat boom, 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 boom. And then it, I, I don't know if they sold it, but it was like a big hit on like YouTube or something like that. And, and it was just like, yeah, it's like, it doesn't take a lot. You just have to strip out all the bullshit about the product and, and your own self of what you want to put yourself into that book. You know, yeah. like, yeah, you know, you can you can reflect your yourself in the dialogue of certain characters and that you build them up, but the visuals of it all and you know the experience of it all, like you want that to appeal to as many people as possible visually. Um, you know, big cool robots or, um, you know, mm. you know Star Wars. You, know, <laughs> you, you got to go big. You got to you you have to produce that great great story. Uh, Superman, like Christopher Reeves, <laughs> you know, yep. you want to do, you want to do that. You don't want to do the uh, Zack Snyder Superman. You want the uh, Christopher Reeves Superman. One hundred percent, man. And like you said, like these books are special. It really is uh, such a shame when you miss out on one of these campaigns and it closes, and you just don't know when it's going to open up again because you really do feel like you missed out on something. Yeah, um, it, and that's something too, is because a lot of comic skaters they'll go into excuse me, they'll go in demand and this is nothing against them. This is how I run my business and I, however people choose, that's fine. Um, during the campaign, that's exciting. You know, when we do uh, graveyard shift, we do two 30 day campaigns. So we go, we go 30 days, then we do an extension. Then we do another 30 days. We're very open with our backers about why we do this because we're trying to maximize any algorithm that's over there at Indiegogo to, to get more attention onto the book and bring in kind of stray fans, people that just might be shopping from the site. Um, but we basically it's a, it's a 60 day campaign. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But, uh, during the time of the campaign, they're exciting. They're fun, uh, especially in that first 30 days. And there might come a time where I only do a 30 day campaign because what happens is you do, especially like my last campaign, my first 30 days were very productive. And I found my second 30 days, you know, to be where it's like really slowing down. I'm still making money, you know, no, you know, I'm very happy with that. But the excitement, is, you know, it's like ah, another 30 days, you know, um, then you get to the final day and it's huge and everyone's really happy again. And you forgot how much of a, of a slog it was for, you know, those final 30 days. Um, some point I would like to get my campaigns to where they're only 30 days, get it done, get everybody in there and through in and out in 30 days. Um, but then I shut down. I don't go in demand. This has just been the way that I've done it. Um because I like that excitement. I like to keep people excited. And once you go in demand, sales really slow down. Uh, again, yeah. unless you have a massive platform that is reaching out to a lot of people that you can just keep pulling in over and over again, it, it's going to be like, it, I think of it as like a, like a zombie campaign. You know, it's like, it's boring. And you're, you're always in sales mode. Like, oh, by the way, go check this out. And for me, I'm just, uh, I mean, it's hard to be in sales mode and to be creative and, you know, actually get work done. So, I mean, because we're also on YouTube and, you know, we've got to draw these books. So that's work. That's time. Um, but, yeah, it's it that same little bit of regret that you feel 
that's good because that's an emotion at least, right? And then when you come, when the next one comes up, it's like Christmas. <laughs> it's like it's yeah. back, it's back. Here it comes. Woo! You people yeah, get feel- excited. Yeah, it's an experience, and uh, I like people. I, I think it's better uh, me for me and my backers. I, I like to have the experience of you know people are like, oh, I missed the last one. Anywhere I can get it, I'm like, not till the next one. But I'll but I'll be sure volume one is there, volume two is there, so you, everyone can catch up. You're not missing out on anything. But it's yeah, it's like a holiday. You know, think of it like a holiday. It's coming around. You know, once a year, it's going to be here again, and then you can catch up and you can get the new one. And, you know, you'll be on board with everybody else. You'll miss out on some of the uh, the exclusive stuff. So, like, you know, my trading cards that I've done, are, you know, I like the last Huerta cover, I had this foil card. And it's uh, Mick the Monster Mayhew. And that's it. I, I think 200 people might have backed the tier that included that option. They're the only ones that are, that are going to get it. It's never coming out again. That card is one of a kind. And uh, now with like the uh, sign up oh, here, let me plug my sign up. Graveyard Shift Volume Three. The sign up is on right now. The, there's going to be another foil trading card, and I think it's it might be Lilith. I'm not I'm not 100 sure. Don't quote me on that yet. But then there's going to be a second trading card. I already have over a thousand backers, or I'm sorry, people signed up on here right now that are going to get that foil trading card. But you know what trading card they're not going to get? Mick the Monster Mayhew <laughs> that, that matches this set. So now that those guys that backed that and got that 240, whatever, now they have something that is legitimately in demand. And then when my next campaign rolls out, I'm going to have another foil card. So like if it's not Lilith, then it'll be Vlad. Um, so I have two versions of trading cards. There's standard trading card, which pretty much anyone can get. You know, it's not that exclusive, not that crazy. But these foil ones are different. So only 200 and some odd people have that Mick card and that's going to be it. You're going to have to buy it off them one day to get that complete set. That's so cool. yeah. I love that exclusivity. Uh, yeah. Make, makes it fun. I've got another question for you. Do you, do you take anything from other people's campaigns? Like do you learn thing from other people's campaigns? Perfect example would be Ethan's honeycomb box, which has been like hmm. a ginormous success. Are you going to do something along those lines? Um, I'm, I'm going to wait um, because I don't know how that works. And um, I, I understand a little bit about the cost, but what are the real costs when it comes to shipping? Because you can't just ship the box. You got to get a box for the box, yeah. um, padding for the box. Um, people want that. It's a $200 box, man. Yeah. So, you know, well, I mean, it's, it, there's books in it as well. And there as well, probably a hundred and maybe, I don't know, maybe $150 worth of books. I don't, I don't know what all he is going to have in there. Um but yeah, I'm going to wait and see because I don't want to be bit in the ass. Like if it turns out Ethan didn't calculate for something or just it, for whatever reason, it became too difficult. I don't want to be committed to something like that. So I'll wait and learn. Um, but yeah, I absolutely learn from other people's campaigns. I, I, I look and see what they're doing. Uh, Richard, when he launched, uh, Ethan, when he launched the original Cyber Frog, um, Kyung Lee, when he did beta, Battle Maiden Knuckle Bomb, he was the first one I saw that went into those tier boxes for those images and lay, and showed you visually what you're going to get. So if it was one copy, he showed one copy. If it was a two copy tier, it'd have two copies in it. If it was a tier with two copies on print, boom, here's an image of the print. Trading card, trading card. So you only have a limited amount of time to get people in there. So, you know, don't, don't think that you, that they're there for you, you're there for them. So if you got 30 seconds to get their attention and really spell it out, do everything you can. That's why I tell people in the, when they do trailers is to do these voiceovers. Like, um, I just saw a trailer <clears throat> recently, 30 seconds looks fine. You know, good music on there, but it didn't tell me anything about the book. And I'm like, you have an opportunity for inform for an information bomb here. Uh, to get people excited about this, um, you know, hey, everybody, thank you for checking out this campaign. I got blah, 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 blah going on in here with art by so-and-so. This is a 80-page uh, graphic novel, full color. Uh, here, It's a story of X, Y, and Z. So uh, get in there and back it now. <laughs> you, know? Yeah, um, you know, you have that time to, to excite people while you still have that music playing underneath and while those images are flashing across the screen. Um you know, you can exactly. you know, again. It's execution. You you can do it well, or you can do it poorly. I, I recommend everyone do it well. 
And it's not just that too. It's also the fact that everyone does that st standard video. So by putting a voiceover, you automatically take it one step above theirs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't stand my voice, guys, but <laughs> but I'm trying. But it, like my videos, like they they run a little long and they're a little uh, slow at the front. Um, but then I get it to build, and um, mm. I'm I'm trying to get people kind of engaged, and it's like two minutes or something like that. But you know, I'm trying to by the end of it have it warmed up and. You know, like a song, you know, you can have a song start slow, but it has to build. It has to get somewhere. And if you can get it, people excited by the end of that, then, you know, that's successful. It's like that Phil Collins song. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. You're waiting for that little drum roll there the whole that's time. It. Yeah. That's it. yeah. You're um, waiting for the beat to drop. That's what you're waiting for. And uh, you can do everything in these videos that anyone has ever accomplished on MTV, you know, musically. Um, anytime you've ever watched a music video on MTV and said, I got to get that album. You know, that's because that commercial, which is that song spoke to you on some level. And, uh, you know, maybe it was the riff, um, doubtful it's a speaker, but maybe the speaker can say something to you that, that piques your interest that, 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 you know, this is a story about a father and a son all of a sudden, Oh, Father and son, that means something to me. All right. Okay. You know, all right. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. So, yeah, heck yeah. yeah. Project Thunder. Um, Thunder. Can you can you tell us anything about it? Uh yeah, Project Thunder is uh after Graveyard Shift Volume 3 launches, is going to be the project that I'm gonna be working on. That's uh gonna be the first project that I write and draw for myself. It's basically the project that I'm gonna be able to work on till doomsday. Um it's something that I can it's going to be designed to keep my interest, my ADD interest. It's going to, it's going to be different time periods uh, where there's going to be like a modern time period. It's going to have superheroes in it um, because superheroes are a hit guys. <laughs> like that's just it. Like, again, know your audience. Comic skate is largely uh, people, refugees from like Marvel and DC. They, they love superheroes. Like we're here for superheroes, uh, but there are actually very few like superhero books out there from comics everyone ended up kind of going like horror and monster route which is fine um but yeah we're superhero refugees so uh, i'm gonna have part of it is going to be taking place during a more modern ish time and that's going to be our kind of like the worlds of superheroes and what's going on other is going to be far off in the future for science the name is project thunder it's only a placeholder name i haven't said what the real name is oh okay um, Cool. But it was called, but it was called that because the initial idea concept was I wanted to do a book that could take place in a world like Thunder the Barbarian, where you could have witches, warlocks, robots, and if a cowboy stumbled in, it wouldn't look out of place. Um, <laughs> so, but the thing is, is again, you can't just think about the project for yourself. You have to think about how do you make it a hundred thousand dollar project um, because fantasy orcs and monsters they're okay but they're not necessarily the big hit stuff so that's why i was like well superheroes where it needs to be for the big hit stuff um but can i do it both can i have it can't i also do a western story well yeah I, I think i can but i have to do it i have to implement these things in and around this superhero story so that's how these different time frames have, have become part of it and uh, other than that everything's under development and uh you know, hopefully in about two months before I launch, which will probably be in the fall sometime, uh, that's when I'll start putting out, you know, images and letting people know exactly where I'm going with the plot and whatnot. So uh, I have a lot of different ideas for it. Uh, but right now I'm, I'm, I'm kind of refocused towards getting Graveyard Shift Volume 3 started. Um, and, oh, and Volume 2 fulfilled. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, got, I got a bunch of sketches I have to do for that still. And... Um, otherwise it's going to be a matter of getting Mark out here to sign, which I think he's ready to come out here within two to three weeks. If we get the books oh, and, no. um, yeah, then full fulfillment after that, then, uh, my attention is going to be to launching graveyard shift volume three and, um, then developing, pr uh, project Thunder and then announcing everything, uh, probably about a month or so after, um, Graveyard Shift Volume Two, and, or I'm sorry, Volume Three ends its campaign. I, I will start announcing stuff about Project Thunder, and then a month or two after that, I'll launch it. Cool, but I've been man. talking about it for a year or two, so that's another point, guys. Get the word out about your projects. So, oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Get so, started. Yeah, my everyone in my circle, they've heard about Project Thunder like a bazillion times, you know, but they're they're still like uh, Rob. They they're like, what's it about? And I'm like, well, I'm still working on that. <laughs> so, yeah. Good to have that little bit of intrigue. Where can people find out more, John, and and follow you on on these updates? Um, well, I Twitter is fine I, at John Malin, like in my little tag there. Um, but YouTube, I'm on there as uh, John Malin. You can just do a search. Uh, I have two channels, and just go to the one with like six thousand subs, not the one with like. 200. <laughs> so uh, if you want to listen to music that I listen to, you can go to the one that has like 200 and then you can, cause I got like playlists that I listen to while I'm, while I'm drawing. They have so many ads on there now. It's driving me crazy. Um, yeah. Just get a lot of tool albums guys and smoke weed and oh, listen man. to that. You, you've got good taste, John. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Good taste. I like your, uh, I like your collages, uh, mailing at midnight that you put together the, the videos mm -hmm. uh, that you do yeah. do on your main they're pretty cool, man. I can tell. Not just your music, but your movie choice as well. You, you've, uh, you've got good taste. Thanks, I appreciate it. Yeah, those are fun too. So that's kind of like the only real video content that I release, um, and I don't release many of them because I, I really have to have an opinion on something and a, a point to be made. And like, there's things like that even go on, like within Comicsgate, you know, and certain dramas that go on there, and people have asked me to make a mail in after midnight on, on these kind of internal dramas. And I'm trying very hard not to, because I don't want to light fires within comics. I don't, I, cause I can drop, like, I'm pretty good with mail in after midnight. I'm pretty good at like driving points home and uh, it's going to upset people. And I don't want that. I, I want, I want comics gate to be united and kicking ass and uh, if everybody's on that page, then great. Um, so I'm, I'm trying very hard not to do anything about that. Um, but it, it, in terms of other things, look, if there's an outside force that that's really getting under my skin or saying things I completely disagree with, then I'll make a mail in after midnight about it. Um, but I mean, it's it's a firebomb. And if, if I do one within comics gate i feel like i'm hurting comics gate and i'm i'm trying not to hurt comics gate i'd love i'd love it if it uh hurt some other people but i don't want to hurt comics gate might yeah. not be far away with with everything that's been happening recently we'll see how it goes i guess yeah yeah well right now i, I feel like things have been simmering down as mm. far as those other yeah, things are going so hopefully that stays the okay. case then again i i don't know cuz i muted half the people so. <laughs> I think you're great, man. Like, just as I said to you the other day on Twitter, just the fact that you do take the time to jump on to, um, you know, relatively new new channels to comic skate. I mean, I haven't been making much of a big splash. It's it's really Rob that that has helped me to to get out there a little bit more within the community. But just the fact that you're here today and giving us your time, telling us about Graveyard Shift, I think it it speaks to the amount of care and, and, and passion that you have for the other creators out there who are trying to do this stuff. So, yeah, we thank you for being here, man. It's, it's a real honor. No, yeah, thanks for having me, guys. It's great. Appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, everyone, go check out Comicscape Books. Uh, you know, uh, you're always supporting an actual artist or a team of artists out there. It's making people's dreams actually come true. Uh, we understand they're higher priced. Generally, they're, these books are signed. Uh, they're pristine books, high quality uh, paper better than what you're going to find at Marvel and DC. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's very important that people get out there and, and, and find a project back it. And uh, yeah, I mean, those dollars put food on tables and, you know, electricity in the computer. So these things can be made. So, yeah. <laughs> and you know, that's the thing. We just want a, enough to make enough money so that we can keep on giving you cool shit, cool mm. comic book. Um, that's we true. Could do that forever. That's true. Um, yeah, a lot of, and that's something else. You know, a lot of the money that you know even comes in through graveyard shift. You know, gets re put out into the next book. You know, I mean, from the very first book, you know, we brought in Nerd Wonder to do this little ash can called Little Graveyard Shift, and you know, our second volume, we had a huge talent search for it, and we brought in two new writers uh, who who are now known, Von Klaus and Cal Jamison, and two new artists uh todd Maruni and render contender so i mean we've you know that's money that you know could have went into my pocket or mark's pocket 
And we said, you know, even as far as like shipping, we could have exp expedited shipping on our first volume to make it get there even quicker. But it was going to cost like six ex extra grand. And we're like, wait, we can use that to pay artists. Yeah. <laughs> so we're like, now nah, we'll just ship, you know, on time and uh, we're going to get some people some work. So, you know, and, you know, this year, because of all this shit that's gone on, I've, I've had to hold off because I'm just I don't know what's going to happen with the pandemic and jobs and stuff like that. So I'm going to be a little bit cautious, cautious this year. But next year, um, the talent search is going to be back. We're going to bring more people in, uh, not, at least one more writer, one more artist, and we'll see what else. Um, but also when we announce what we're doing with volume three coming out in June, guys, you'll see where the money's <laughs> going. So um, big stuff. I'm excited for it. And uh, yeah, I, I think people are going to be very excited when, when we start putting like the teaser trailer out for it's volume good. three. Right. And some of these yeah. names are going to be like, oh, no shit. John's out there scooping them up. That's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean, it. And a new industry forming out there and um i was gonna ask you uh, earlier actually john what do you think is gonna happen with the mainstream do you think it's gonna find its legs again and and reignite maybe uh rebuild itself in a, in a better way or do you think this is uh you know maybe the end for for good well, I, I think it's very possible that, you know, I mean, the industry with retailers could limp ar around for a while. I, I think it's definitely at the point of transformation. Um, part of that transformation is crowdfunding through, you know, places like Comicsgate and building up networks. You know, look, it doesn't have to be a Comicsgate network, but it, you have to have a network that really helps. Uh, the problem is sometimes it takes a nuclear bomb to go off for a network to form. That's what happened with Comicsgate, and that's why we're around, because we had that nuclear bomb. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's going to transform. It's going to go into crowdfunding. Um, but I, I think it just on the corporate level, like Marvel and DC, they're – uh, they're going to I feel like they're going to kind of fade from the retailer space as we know it in terms of comic shops. I think those are going to largely go away. Um, maybe you'll find some comics in Walmart, Myers, stuff like that, maybe just around promotional time for the next big film. Um, mm. But, you know, politically, stuff like that, I, I, I don't know. I'm cautious because we'd see what they're doing with the phase two. And it's like they're getting rid of all their big money makers to kind of usher in some of these. Uh, other characters that you know people may not be as familiar with, like I don't know, even Doctor Strange. Do we really need any more Doctor Strange movies? I don't know. Uh, I'm looking forward to the Black Widow movie. Um, yeah, me too. Um, yeah. That, other, other than that, I, it's kind of like it's like who cares? Skaja, she's a babe. Oh, yeah, um, she's on. <laughs> so uh, th here's here's a uh, a question, a point of contention that I see come up every now and then. Be interesting to hear what your answer is to it, uh, mm. John. Um, Kingdom Comics says I cannot afford many of the Comics Gate comics. Uh, lol, I couldn't afford them really at four dollars an issue. I backed Titan Mouse and yeah. uh, of mine though. Um, so yeah, I mean they're what twenty five dollars a pop USD. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Um, well. In the case of the person that wrote that, I mean, they're homeless. <laughs> so um, $4, oh. I, I think most people can afford $4 for, you know, a DVD, pack of cigarettes. Uh, $4 isn't, isn't that much. If you wanted to get comics, you would. I, I think that person's problem is there's nothing that interests them at $4. And then that's fine. Uh, $25 is more pricey. Uh, again, I... You know, these are pristine books, you know, we're and this is what it takes. People don't like to admit it, but this is what it takes for independent uh, creators to make money in comic books. Um, mm -hmm. I used to work at Image Central, guys, and uh, I saw what they made and it's not a lot. And it goes away after about the second issue and they're all broke. They're fucking broke. Um, they they. They, they're so busy sniffing each other's butts, though. No one wants to admit that they're broke, but they're fucking broke, guys. All those people at Image Comics, there's maybe a, a five, maybe five of them are, are actually making reasonable enough money. I've seen books that sell nothing, um, but I don't know why. Maybe it's certain deals that are going on, but some of these guys just get – maybe it's belief. Maybe it's something that Eric Stevenson or Jim Valentino really believed in. But they just let these books go on till doomsday. Maybe it's just for the fact that the creative team 
is too stubborn to give up, <laughs> you know, and image needed to have content for that month. I don't know. Um, but I know there are people out there that are working well below poverty levels, uh, at least when I was working at Image Comics, uh, Image Central. And uh, I actually knew what they were getting, uh, poverty, poverty. So um, if you if you want to have four dollar comics, that's great. And, you know, one, you know, comic skate could have four dollar comics one day. But you got to have tens of thousands of fans to be able to, to put out four dollar comic books and actually put some extra money in your pocket, pay your bills, stuff like that. Twenty five dollars makes it a lot easier, a lot, a lot more possible for you to create the art and actually pay your bills, like actually pay your bills and like keep your fucking lights on. I'm not talking about making people rich. I'm talking about basic rent for a fucking apartment. And so you can keep busy and maybe have a little bit of food on the table for your wife, maybe your family. And so you can hold your head up high. Twenty five dollars is that price. So what we do is we try to make it that twenty five dollars worth it to the people that want to back at those prices. Uh, again, higher cover cover quality, higher interior page quality. You know, these are full color, not that special. But when it's on that higher quality, like people, when they grab Graveyard Shift Volume One over and over and over again, people have said. John, this felt like a twenty-five dollar book. It, it feels like a twenty-five dollar book. It's thicker. It's it, the paper's nice and thick and sturdy. Like comic book fans, like that's what we notice. You know, you flip through a Marvel book and it's just like flap, flap, tear. The ink's coming off on your thumb. And, you know, when you have good quality paper and, and good stock, like that matters. And uh, you know, again, you want to make it worth it. You know. You throw a signature on there. Guess what? Now you just save that person a trip to a convention to hunt you down, to get out, gas to get there, flight to get there, hotel to stay there, admission costs to enter there just to get to your table. Hello. <laughs> Kid. What's your girl's name, Rob? Phoenix. Oh, wow. Hi, Phoenix. That's a cool name. <laughs> Thank you. We think so, but you know. But we try to we try to make it worth it, guys. Um, and uh, you know, book even little things like bookmarks and whatever else it takes to get people to go in there and back that. Um, you know, and, and that's like that twenty five dollar option. Then the other options are you actually have, you know, a, a stable income, expendable income, and then you want to drop seventy five dollars. And there's a lot of people willing to drop seventy five dollars, guys. Um, Two hundred dollars for Ethan's uh, box. <laughs> um, his tier. I backed it at that. I, I backed it for that box too. Um, yeah, there's plenty of people with expendable income still. A lot of people, again, a lot of people um, that are into superhero comics and were rejected from the mainstream are 40, 30, 40 year old guys who already have careers set. Some of them are nearing or at retirement age and they're coming over here and they're saying, yeah, man, just give me comics. I don't mind dropping a grand. <laughs> you know, so we'll oblige. We'll happily oblige. We'll give the customers what they want. Um, and and there are goals um, to kind of go back to that. Like, here's my own personal goal. I don't say anything for anybody else, but here's my own personal goal. If it's not during Graveyard Shift Volume 3, because I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet until my fulfillment is over, because uh, I'm going to be making decisions based on that. Um, but if it doesn't happen by Volume 3, it will be happening by Volume 4, where I take all the back issues. So if it's volume three, I will have back issue. The volume one and volume two, I will combine them into one book. And instead of having to pay $50 for two books, you can pay $25 for this one collected edition of those two volumes. That's how my prices are going to come down by giving you more content for the same amount of money. The initial books, as I launch them, will always stay at, at least as for the foreseeable future, $25 because that's what it costs to keep the lights on. And as long as you guys keep coming in to back graveyard shift at these high amounts that get me up to 100 or 150, whatever the case may be, um, then uh, again, I'm going to take that money. I'm going to hire more artists and more writers. and I'm going to get more people involved. Like next year can be very big. So depending on how, how pandemic year goes, if I'm still successful, the next year could be a huge, huge improvement or in terms of more books in the same campaign for less. Heck yeah, man. No, that sounds really, really good to me. And just to add to that as well, I think there's there's a lot of good things about um, these comic books being $25 USD, in my opinion. Uh, the first thing is that, yes, of course, it helps to support the independent creators out there. 
Um, but you're also paying for something that's a little bit more special than what you'd get, you know, coming from a large company in the mainstream. It's, you know, that that stuff is is cheap for a reason in comparison. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the other really great thing that twenty five dollars a pop does is it increases the the importance of quality a little bit more. So there's a little there's more competition there. If you want somebody to pay twenty five dollars for a book, you better make damn sure that the art is top notch and that the writing mm-hmm. is good so that people come back to it afterwards. Yep. Um, definitely helps. Great- definitely helps. I mean, some books may come out and they may not be, you know, look, I mean, Ethan is a 20 something year old veteran of comics. And, you know, I've, I've done eh, sporadic time in comics, you know, let's say five years, you know, let's say I've done five years of professional work. Um, you know, not everybody has that. I, I don't know. I'm not trying to sound like big headed, but not everyone has that like level of execution. So um, yeah. there's, you know, there's books out there that are still 25 bucks that may not be my cup of tea, like art wise or whatnot. But sometimes I just like the people and, and that's coming from the customer point of view as well is also in that value is like if I sit and watch Clayton all, you know, three times a week, four times a week or whatnot. And I feel like I've, I've been building up as a fan, like a relationship. You know, I, I understand him. I like him. I respect him, his work, whatnot. And then you go out there and put out something and may, maybe I, I'm not saying you claim, but I'm just saying, and anyone, maybe yeah. you're not up to sure. cyber frog level, right? You know, your career or maybe that execution of detail. Maybe you're not up there. I don't know. But again, I'm sorry. I picked you, but I, I just, no, first it, person it, it, the room, I like that. But uh, let, let's say you're a first year artist or even a second year and it's real rough, but I still, I, I tune in here to, to check you out and hear what you have to say, your point of view, your opinions, uh, you know, on art and whatnot. Uh, if I'm subscribing to you, then I, I, I want to hang out. I want to reward you for that, man. And, you know, this yeah, is me also saying, you know, look, you may not make a million dollars on YouTube either. But for the the hours that I that you spend entertaining me or having guests on and you know interesting conversations, I feel you should be rewarded. And twenty five dollars isn't that much in terms of uh, rewarding you for that. And hey, I get a comic book for it. It's not like it's not like it's a one way transaction with nothing in return. So um, yeah, I, I mean, um, yeah. you know, Naylan uh, Naylan Malin says, uh, "Come on, Clayton." It's forty to fifty dollars for a comic book for us Aussies and Australian dollars, and mm. totally. And hey, I, I get that, but you know, it's a funny thing. Great like- shift, isn't? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, here, here's what I do. Okay, guys. Um, well, eh, forty bucks is close. Um, so international charging and guys, do whatever you feel is su- safe and responsible for you guys. International charging is a pain. So most of your market, uh, eighty to 85, probably 85% of your market is in the United States. Like hands down, that's it. Uh, Liam said he thought, you know, he'd have a lot of people backing from Australia. I think he said he had nine, nine backers. So getting a book from the the States to Australia, that's going to be pricey. Um, So what I do is I charge $10 domestic. So that means everyone in the U.S., it's it's 10 bucks, Uh, Guam, Puerto Rico, you know, whatever these other Virgin Island, stuff like that. You you try to keep all those domestic price, 10 bucks. Does it cost 10 bucks to ship this? Not really. Uh, Media mail in the States, you're looking at three to four bucks. I use Gemini mailers. I think they might come out to like 50 to 70 some cents. Um, Everything gets bagged. Everything gets boarded. Now there is, there should be considered like a shipping and handling fee. And someone has to physically put all this stuff together for the campaign, put it in, you know, put the sticker on it, ship it, do all the paperwork for customs, send everything out. Someone has to do that. Um, but here's my, my sensibility. I, I try not to think of that as like a shipping and handling. If it makes you, if it makes you as a customer feel better about shipping and handling, call it shipping and handling. I try to take whatever extra comes from that $10 and I put that towards the international. So when I did Graveyard Shift Volume 1, I had the international set at $12. Um, And that's me giving people that are $30 international a huge, huge break. Um, And uh, the second campaign, I think I went up to $15. So this one, because I'm maxing out the weight, I have like four books going to a lot of these backers 
And uh, so I'm going to find out what the true cost of that. It cost me four, about $14,000 to ship Graveyard Shift Volume 1. I'm expecting wow. Volume 2 to cost between thirty dollars and $50,000. I don't know. Um, but I have the money, so I'm prepared for it. Crazy. Um, and, and then I'll find out what's left you know, after that and what I can do with that money after that. Um, but I don't know how much it's going to cost. So once I go through this shipping, then I'm going to actually go through and I'm going to start figuring out rates and uh, what's going to be like just the perfect rate. I, I hope I got it right now. Um, but if it turns out that I'm actually pulling more money from my own profits than I am from what I actually charge on people, then that's probably a bit of a problem from a business point of view. Um, yeah. But I'm going to find out what it all is. And because what I want to do is that's one of the biggest hangups for people, especially international people like uh, Clayton um, or Rob. Is you guys yeah. are in Australia. You got nine backers. <laughs> you know what I mean? Let, let's say you have 100. Um so yeah. you guys could fulfill those if you wanted, whatnot. But basically, one of the biggest problems, even Carl Rowe in Ireland, is 80% of your market is here. So you don't want to be charging international Big shipping time. here because these guys are going to max you out. They're going to buy all your shit. So you want the, you want the shipping here to be probably no more than 10 bucks um, to, to, for anyone in the States. But the biggest problem for you guys is fulfillment. How do you do that? So... And this is for everybody, even people in the state. So if my fulfillment goes well, if I don't want to pull my hair out, if I'm going through all these customs, because Mark Poulton did the, the first campaign. I'm doing this campaign at home. Um, but I'm hiring people to come in here and stuff boxes. I'm hiring people to come in here and mail stuff out. If it goes well, then I'm going to start a fulfillment company. And I'm going to start offering people to come in here. And and, and all you're going to have to do is... A, is you know, comic skater is set your shipping prices to whatever I I'm going to figure out is to be the true price and weight, uh, including calculations for Gemini mailers, baggers, borders, everything. Plus the cost to have people come in and stuff all this stuff. I'm going to try to keep it at $10 for domestic. Um, so if you are trying, if you're international, awesome. if you're international, all you have to do is set pr presumably all you'll have to do is set your, your, your U.S. rates at ten dollars, um, and then you ship your books to me. I'm well, whatever my company, and then they're going to send it out to everybody in the states, and it's going to be at that great low price. And then you can fulfill yourself for international, whatnot, or you can, it, or you can have us do your international. It doesn't matter. So, um, but we're gonna have to find a way of accounting for that. And then if you guys wanted to get fancy with it, you'll have to take a little bit of risk on how you want to junk jumble jumble the uh the shipping for different international from your point of view but anyways that's one of the biggest problems is uh fulfillment it's a headache as artists and writers we don't want to do it trust me even i don't want to do it um that's why i'm hiring people to do it for me uh they're they're going to come to my home they're going to stuff boxes and we're going to see how this works out if it's not a nightmare then uh, i'm going to try to do it as a uh, as a side job and i think that's going to be a, if i don't do it someone else has to do it so yeah yeah i think that's a great idea man um look we better uh we better wrap it up here but uh thanks replicator are you still there Nah, i think he's probably ran off with the kid <laughs> he's already ran sorry off. i'm here and not here there's the kids running around so no uh, that's thanks, all right John, for coming on um appreciate it um yeah i'm gonna have to head off see you guys yeah uh, yeah no worries, um, yeah clayton thanks for having me on appreciate it man and uh hey, man, guys uh uh, don't don't let this discredit me, but uh, thank you very much for having me. And flat Earth is real. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> guys, go jump onto the email list for Graveyard Shift Volume Three. It is in the link within the description below this video. Be sure to click it, sign up. You got nothing to lose, and this is going to be one heck of a book. So, uh, again, John, thanks so much for coming on, man, and sharing a, a little bit about your background and experience as a comic book artist in the industry and of course talking about graveyard shifts showing us a few previews and then sharing your drawing your actual drawing techniques and, and doing a bit of a demo with us we're yeah, very no very problem. lucky to uh, have had you real quick clayton uh you and your brother do you guys have two different books coming out yeah so uh, here, here's how it's working uh, we've got kozor issue one coming up real real quick within a matter of months um, and that one is a finished comic book by Corey. 
And what we're doing within the next three months is he's adding additional story pages to it. I'm helping him touch up the art, doing the editing and doing a cover for it. And then we're going to go ahead and launch it. At the same time, I'm doing a comic book myself, although I'm in the very early stages of that. So we're talking pre-production art, character concepts. It'll probably be a year before I launch a campaign for that because okay. I want to have most of it done. Uh, what's the one um, Corey's launching? Uh, it's it's Kozor issue one. Um, we, we've been putting out a Kozor. few things about okay. it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a fun comic book, man. It might even be up your alley. There's a lot of uh, horror and medieval uh, yeah. themes to it. So we'll have to yeah, show you some time. Sorry? Oh, I said, yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, it'll be cool. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, man, it's uh, it, we're, we're, we're really excited about it and obviously very nervous. So your point is today, your advice uh, is, is certainly something that, that I was taking notes on. Appreciate it. Just my opinions, guys. You know, everyone do what best works for you guys. Find happiness, whatever you do. Absolutely, man. All right, then. Well, I'll let you go. Thanks again, John, and I uh, hope to chat with you next time. All right. Have a great one, guys. Bye. Bye. Catch you later, everyone. <laughs>